Let us pray. Almighty God, we willingly acknowledge you as a supreme being most gracious and most merciful. Look down, we beseech you, on us who are members of this Senate and deign to assist us in the duties that we have to perform on behalf of our beloved country of Trinidad and Tobago. Open our eyes to see the truth and help us to accept it with all its implications into our lives. Direct us, O Lord, in our deliberations so that setting aside private interests, unwholesome prejudices, and personal affections, <clears throat> we may treat all matters set before us with honesty, courage, and conviction. Through all we say and do in this Senate, may we give glory and honor to your holy name, inspire confidence in our fellow citizens, and make a positive contribution to the peace and prosperity of our nation. Amen. Announcements by the President. Honorable Senators, I have granted leave of absence to Senator the Honorable Donna Cox and Senator Damian Lyder, both of whom are out of the country. Honorable Senators, I have received the following correspondence from Her Excellency the President Christine Carla Kangalu, ORTT. Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, by Her Excellency Christine Carla Kangalu, ORTT, President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, to Mr. Michael Seals, whereas Senator the Honorable Donna Cox is incapable of performing her duties as a Senator by reason of illness. Now, therefore, I, Christine Carla Kangalu, President as aforesaid, in exercise of the power vested in me by Section 441B and Section 444A of the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, acting in accordance with the advice of the Prime Minister, do hereby appoint you, Michael Seals, to be a member of the Senate temporarily, with effect from the 16th of April 2024 and continuing during the absence of Senator the Honorable Donna Cox by reason of illness. To Mr. Colin Neil Cosine, whereas Senator Damien Lyder is incapable of performing his duties as a senator by reason of his absence from Trinidad and Tobago, now therefore I, Christine Carla Kangolo, President is aforesaid, in exercise of the power vested in me by Section 441A and Section 444B of the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago acting in accordance with the advice of the Leader of the Opposition, do hereby appoint you, Colin Neil Gassine, to be a member of the Senate temporarily with effect from the 16th of April 2024 and continuing during the absence from Trinidad and Tobago of Senator Damien Lyder, given under my hand and the seal of the President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago as the Office of St. Anne's for the Office of the President St. Anne's, the 16th day of April, 2024. Honorable Senators, Senators are required to take the oath. Seals, having been appointed a member of parliament, do swear by Almighty God that I will bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago, will uphold the Constitution and the law, and will conscientiously and impartially discharge responsibilities to the people of Trinidad and Tobago upon which I am about to enter.
I, Colin Neil Gosain, having been appointed a member of parliament, do swear by Almighty God that I'll bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago and uphold the constitution and the law and will conscientiously and impartially discharge the responsibilities of the people of Trinidad and Tobago upon which I'm about to enter. Honorable Senators, I have received the following correspondence from the Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives. Re-changing membership of joint select committees. Reference is made to the subject at caption. At a sitting held on Friday, April 12, 2024, the House of Representatives agreed to the following resolution. Be it resolved that the House agree to the following appointments to Joint Select Committees. One, on the Joint Select Committee on Finance and Legal Affairs, Mr. Simon Dinabriga, MP, in lieu of Mr. Terence Dial Singh, MP. And two, on the Joint Select Committee on Foreign Affairs, Mrs. Lisa Morris Julian, MP, in lieu of Mr. Terence Dial Singh, MP. Accordingly, I respectfully request that the Senate be informed of this decision at the earliest convenience, please. Respectfully, Esmond Ford, MP, Deputy Speaker of the House. Honorable Senators, the Right Honorable Mr. Justice Michael de la Bastide, TC, Chief Justice retired, passed away on Saturday, March 30th, 2024. I now invite members to offer tributes. Leader of Government Business. Mr. President, I rise to pay tribute to one of the most outstanding jurists in the history of Trinidad and Tobago, the Right Honorable Mr. Justice Michael Anthony de la Bastide, former Chief Justice of Trinidad and Tobago and former President of the Caribbean Court of Justice, who departed this life on the 30th of March, 2024. His friends and colleagues have described him as a luminary, a legend, a mentor to many, a colossus of the legal profession, and as someone who was always in the pursuit of excellence. And this is just to name a few of the accolades that are worthy of emphasis and repetition. A special honor falls to me today to present a tribute to this larger than life son of the soil, whose passing bestows upon us the duty to recognize his sterling contributions to the upholding of our democratic principles and to the strengthening and deepening of our tradition of maintaining an independent judiciary. The Right Honorable Mr. Justice Michael de la Bastide first saw the light of day on the 18th of July, 1937, he was born in Port of Spain in the period between two world wars, which was a very important era for the Caribbean territories that were still part of the British Empire, and especially an important era for Trinidad and Tobago, which was still a few decades away from realizing our independence from the United Kingdom. It was an era of great turmoil, challenge, 
and momentous change when scarcity and necessity became the parents of invention and innovation, mirrored in part by the emergence of our national instrument, the, the steel pan. It was a period of labor unrest, of intensified cries against social injustice, of a rising tide of grassroots political activism, of continued cultural awakening, and of other distinct elements that were to help forge a new sense of nationhood at the time. Michael lost his father when he was just nine years old, collapsing suddenly on the tram one sunny morning as it moved slowly around the savannah in Port of Spain. But he had seven older siblings and a strong Catholic mother who was determined to raise her children well. So he grew up in the absence of wealth whilst surrounded by loving support. Great women and men are forged out of dynamic social and cultural currents of various kinds under the steady guidance of their family, mentors, communities, as well as the faith, convictions, and determination to succeed. And Michael de Labestide can certainly be counted among such greats. Against that backdrop, a stalwart and imposing young man developed his determined and generous character, his intellect, enthusiasm, love of learning, and his cleverness, his leadership attributes on an exciting journey from youth to adulthood. From 1945 to 1955, he attended St. Mary's College in Port of Spain, where he did exceedingly well, eventually being awarded the Trinidad and Tobago Island Scholarship in language, Languages in 1954. His dear wife, Simone, remembers him saying, and I quote, if I had not won that scholarship, I would not even have a university degree as my mother could not afford to send me to university." Unquote. Some of us here can relate. From 1956 to 1960, this blossoming academic attended the University of Oxford, where he read law attaining the degrees of Bachelor of Arts Jurisprudence with first-class honors in 1959 and the Bachelor of Civil Law with first-class honors in 1960. Mr. Delabastide served as a part-time tutor in law at Christ Church from 1960 to 1961, and he was also awarded a Cunningham Marchese Scholarship and James Mould QC Scholarship from Gray's Inn, having become a member of Gray's Inn in 1956. He was called to the bar on the 7th of, Jan of, the 7th of February, 1961. Always presenting a practical combination of balance, persistence, and daring in his undertakings throughout his life's journey, during his sojourn at Oxford University, Michael de Labastide was not just brilliant at academics, but he also became the captain of that university's lawn tennis team. He was also a member of the Oxford University hockey team. A love of sports remained with him throughout his life, and he would later proceed to represent Trinidad and Tobago in the sport of hockey at the 1971 Pan American Games in Colombia. And he also represented us in the game of bridge in several international tournaments between 1980 and 1995. Additionally, he served as a member of the management committee of the Queen's Park Cricket Club from 1969 to 1992 and held the position of vice president of that club from 1982 to 1992. His academic and all-round foundation led him to a distinguished and absolutely outstanding career in the legal profession, some elements of which I will now highlight. From 1961 to 1963, Mr. de Labastide worked as Crown Counsel in the Office of the Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago, following which he entered private practice. He had the privilege and distinction of serving as a member of both the Wooding Constitution 
Commission, and later on, the Hayatali Constitution Commission. And in between, he was appointed Queen's Council in January 1975. Bearing in mind my earlier references to the dynamic historical period into which he was born, it really should have come as no surprise that Michael also developed a keen interest in national politics. In this vein, he, first, he served in the first Republican Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago from 1976 to 1981 in this very house as an independent senator. There again, he was balanced, measured, well-spoken, well-researched, respected, and respectful. And he sought to represent the public interest in every debate that he joined. Michael de la Bastide was elected president of the Law Association of Trinidad and Tobago for three terms from 1987 to 1990, and thereafter became senior partner of the law firm de la Bastide and Jocelyn. With an already resplendent career behind his name, in 1995, Michael de la Bastide was honored to be appointed Chief Justice of our country by the then President of the Republic, His Excellency Nur Hassan Ali, on May 31st, 1995. One year later, the new Chief Justice was also awarded the highest national honor in Trinidad and Tobago, at the time, the Trinity Cross, in August 1996. In November of that year, he was elected as an honorary bencher of Gray's Inn and was created a Fellow of the Society for Advanced Legal Studies in the year 2000. In July 2002, Mr. Justice de la Bastide demitted office as Chief Justice, and he was sworn in as a member of the Privy Council by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II on the 27th of July 2004. And on August 18th, 2004, he was sworn in as the very first president of the Caribbean Court of Justice. The establishment of the CCJ here in Port of Spain, along with his having become its first president, was no small achievement for Justice Michael de la Bastide, as the establishment of the Caribbean Court of Justice was a cause very dear to his heart, for which he had been a very vocal, articulate, and important advocate. It has been noted to his credit that as the CCJ's inaugural president, it fell to him to give guidance on a range of considerations and processes. Given that the CARICOM region did not boast of any other court or even any other regional institutions that were analogous to the CCJ. Furthermore, his belief in the potential of the institution and his careful articulation of the view that Caribbean jurisprudence had long come of age cannot be overstated. He worked ardently and tirelessly alongside others to promote the idea that the CCJ should and must become the final court of appeal for Trinidad and Tobago and the other member states of our Caribbean community. For this, as well as his previously outlined attributes, Mr. de la Bastide holds a special place in the hearts of many at that distinguished institution and indeed throughout CARICOM. Even though the ebb and flow of opinion on the CCJ question continues to present much fodder for debate in some quarters. The Right Honorable Mr. Justice Michael de la Bastide re retired from the Caribbean Court of Justice on 18th August 2011, but his legacy lives on in its hallowed halls and across many other institutions that he graced with his distinguished presence. Mr. Justice Michael de la Bastide was also known for his great generosity towards colleagues, friends, mentees, community, an aspect of his character that is already borne out in some of the extracurricular, extracurricular activities mentioned earlier, as well as through other personal engagements. For example, his membership on the Board of Management of the St. Dominic's Children's Home 
for two decades, from 1968 <clears throat> to 1988. He served in several other charitable capacities, contributing not just his time, but also freely giving legal advice and funding to individuals and organizations that supported challenged and marginalized young people and the most needy in society. In the words of his dear wife, Simone, he always found ways to pay it forward, quietly and consistently. She describes him as a formidable, confident man who firmly believed in God. And thusly, I also wish to pay tribute to Michael de Labastide as a family man. The family remains the greatest crucible of our formation as individuals and communities, and our families are our greatest support groups, providing us with strength and resilience and endurance. And Michael's family meant a great, great deal to him and contributed to his overall success in life. I'm honored to once again extend sincere and most profound condolences to his dear wife, Mrs. Simone de Labastide, and to his children, Michelle, Juliet, Simon, Chantal, and Christian. I also extend my heartfelt sympathies to his grandchildren, siblings, and all re other relatives, as well as to the many close friends of his family. The government and people of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago joined his family in paying final ceremonial respects to the Right Honorable Mr. Justice Michael de Labastide on April 11, 2024, during the official funeral held in his honor in Port of Spain. That official funeral service was a product of collaboration, dedication, respect, and love in direct reflection of the attributes that contributed to his legacy of great service to our nation and the wider region. The body of work proceeding from his astute mind and his flowing pen, much like his indomitable spirit, which returns to its maker, must certainly live on thanks to his indelible contributions to this society. In New Zealand, there's a type of tree that lives for hundreds of years called the Totara. When a great man dies, the Maori people of New Zealand say that the mighty Totara has fallen. And I got that example from his family in speaking to them. The mighty Totara has fallen. Yesterday evening, I chatted with Simone on how admired and appreciated her husband was. It turns out that he was not perfect. And just like everyone else on this planet, that great man was actually not great at everything. He loved the ocean and boating, but boating did not always love him in return. Indeed, she told me that on his very first day out on the water with his boat, somehow the jetty got in the way. Thankfully, no lives were lost in the incident. And then they were out at sea on another occasion and observed a stranded fisherman whose engine had actually fallen off into the water. Always want to help, Michael offered to tow the little pirog to safety. So a long rope was used to tie the fisherman's boat behind the Delabasti boat, and all went well until Michael abruptly and accidentally went full throttle, causing the fisherman to flip off of his boat into the air, somersaulting and landing into the water. Thankfully, again, no lives were lost. But maybe this was the great Delabasti reminding us that he was human and not perfect at everything. Though legend has it that he eventually got the hang of boating. In his last days, Michael lost his vision, but with a deep sense of faith, love, and support, he continued to navigate through life. His oldest and dearest friend, 
Boyd Reed used to visit him and patiently read various books for him, four days per week, four books at a time. Four days per week, four books at a time. Sadly, Boyd passed away one week before Michael left this earth. Mr. President, on behalf of the government of Trinidad and Tobago, and on behalf of the government bench in this Senate, I say thank you to Mr. Michael de la Bastide. Thank you as well to everyone that nurtured him, that supported him, admired him, prayed for him, protected him, and defended him, and believed in him along his earthly journey and particularly to every member of his family. May they always find comfort in his memory and strength in his legacy. And may God rest his soul for all eternity. Mr. President, I thank you. Senator Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, On behalf of my colleagues on the front bench, on behalf of the alternative government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, we would like, on this occasion, Mr. President, to pay tribute to what we would like to describe as a noble gentleman, a scholar, a jurist extraordinaire, not only here in Trinidad and Tobago, but regionally and internationally. The former Right Honorable Chief Justice graced this August house in his wisdom as a senator. Michael de la Bastide, sunrise was on the 8th of July, 19. 37 and sunset on the 30th of March 2024. He was an outstanding lawyer. He was this country's Chief Justice from 1995 until 2002. The late Justice Michael de la Bastide was Crown Counsel in the Office of the Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago from 1961 till 1963. Mr. President, in 1975, he became a Queen's Council at the age of 38 years. 
He served as an independent senator from 1976 to 1981 in the Senate where we are located. He was also the president of the Law Association of Trinidad and Tobago from 1987 until 1990, prior to his appointment as Chief Justice in 1995. Mr. President, in 2005, he was sworn in as President of the Caribbean Court of Justice until his retirement in 2011. Indeed, Mr. President, the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago has lost a noble gentleman. of this nation whose wisdom has contributed immensely to nation building in the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. We in, we on this side rather, of the House wish to extend to the family, the bereaved family of the late Michael de la Bastide, our very deep and sincere condolences in this period of grief and sorrow, as they mourn his loss and passing. Mr. President, may his soul rest in peace, eternal peace. And may his soul rise in perpetual glory. We say farewell to the former Chief Justice of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago and the first president of the Caribbean Court of Justice. I thank you, Mr. President. Senator Vera. <clears throat> Mr. President, former Chief Justice, the Right Honorable Michael Anthony de Labastide, holder of the Trinity Cross, Privy Councillor, King's Council, Masters of Arts from Oxford University, was one of the finest legal minds this country has produced. Michael was a force of nature. A St. Mary's College old boy, he won an island scholarship and then secured a double first at Oxford. In his heyday, he was the undoubted leader at the bar. Among his many achievements, he had the distinction of serving on both the Wooding Constitution Commission, thinking things through, and the Hayatali Constitution Commission, thinking things over. Michael served as an independent senator for five years, 
1976 to 1981. He served as the president of the Law Association for three terms between 1987 to 1990. Internationally, Michael was a bench of Gray's Inn, a fellow of the Society for Advanced Legal Studies, and he sat as a member of the Privy Council. Michael worked tirelessly for the development of judicial education, judicial independence, and jurisprudence in this country. He was a distinguished Chief Justice, jumping to that position straight from the bar, and then making signal improvements to the judiciary's administration. And as you've heard, he was the first president of our Caribbean Court of Justice. Michael was a man of principle who believed in justice and who lived what he believed. Though brilliant, he was never vain or boastful. There can be no gain saying the fact that this proud son of the soil has rendered yeoman service to his beloved country. Significantly, Michael <coughs> de Labastide was not one-dimensional. The bull had many interests, including a passion for bridge and a love for sport, in particular field hockey and tennis. He enjoyed a good fete and playing mass. Indeed, and this is before, of course, he became a judge, tales about his joie de vivre at carnival time were legendary. He had the amazing capacity to both work and play hard. Most of all, Michael had heart. He loved life, his family, and he was devoted to this beautiful land of ours. He lived life to the fullest. Michael represents the best of what Trinidad and Tobago can offer. We should be proud of him, we should celebrate him, and we should honor his legacy. On a personal note, I can say that Michael de Labasid is the reason I decided to pursue a career in law. He was my pupil master, and he presented my petition of call to the bar. At a critical time when I was at a crossroads of having to choose between pursuing further education or practicing at the bar, it was a rare privilege of seeing Michael de Labastid on his legs at the bar table, watching his logical mind at work as he crafted pleadings and hearing him make submissions in court so eloquently and powerfully that decided the matter for me. Doing research and settling drafts for Michael could be very humbling. Your script would be returned with lines running right through every part that he considered unacceptable, with little scribbling notes and annotations offering guidance. He was a stickler for language. Sitting behind Michael as he engaged in forensic battle with the likes of Tajmul Hossein, Bruce Prokop, and Ewart Thorne was intoxicating and inspiring. He commanded the courtroom with his gravitas. Michael de Labasi was truly a lion at the bar. Today, that mighty roar has fallen silent, but the memory of it will resonate for years to come. On behalf of the independent bench, we claim Michael de Labastide as one of our own, and we offer sincere and deepest condolences to those who are closest and dearest to him. I thank you. Honorable Senators, I too would like to pay tribute to Justice Michael de Labastide a man of progressive ideology and a true example of patriotism. Justice de la Bastide was appointed an independent senator during the first Republican Parliament from 1976 to 1981. During his short parliamentary career, he sought to demonstrate how persons elected to the Houses of Parliament could use their platforms to give credibility to significant international, regional, and domestic matters of public interest. Honorable members, 
Justice de la Bastide made contributions to several debates throughout his tenure in the Senate and never reframed from giving voice to the minority perspective. During the cut and thrust of a debate in the Senate on the Pleasure Boats Bill in 1977, Justice de la Bastide noted, and I quote, we should be debating things like housing, one of the most intractable and urgent problems that is besetting the country. This brief quote is evidence that Justice de la Bastide always championed pressing issues of the day, whether or not these issues were popular ones. Another cause in which he was invested was the preservation of the institution of parliament and its representation role. This was made apparent during his contribution to the Guarantee of Loans Companies Act 1978, in which Justice de la Bastide brought the following message into focus, and I quote, we live in a time, if I may suggest so, when Parliament is very much on trial in the minds of the people of this country, and I, for one, would like to see this institution preserved. Furthermore, honorable senators, his fervor to advance his country and its social institutions was also evident from his 20-year membership on the Board of Management of the St. Dominic's Children's Home. Indeed, Justice de la Bastide was passionate about democracy, but his most significant achievements were born from his undying commitment to law and jurisprudence. He was appointed Chief Justice of Trinidad and Tobago by the then President of the Republic, Mr. Noor Hassan Ali, on May 31, 1995. Justice de la Bastide was shortly thereafter awarded Trinidad and Tobago's then highest national honor, the Trinity Cross, in August 1996. His many accolades speak to the time talent, and treasures he dedicated to the development of the legal discipline in Trinidad and Tobago and the wider Caribbean. From Crown Council to Chief Justice and President of the Caribbean Court of Justice, the legal fraternity has undoubtedly enjoyed the privilege of his many brilliant contributions. I take this opportunity to express my deepest admiration and respect for Justice de Bastide's significant accomplishments. I also wish to extend sincerest condolences to the De La Bastide family during their time of bereavement on behalf of myself, my family, and all the members of the Senate gathered here today. I pray that the Almighty grants them strength, peace, and consolation during this difficult time. I now ask that we stand and observe a minute of silence as a mark of respect. Honorable Senators, I hereby instruct the clerk to convey our deep condolences and kind sentiments to the family of the late Mr. Michael de la Bastille. Honorable Senators, former Senator Justice Amrika Tiwari Reddy retired passed away on Sunday, Saturday, April 6, 2024. I now invite members to offer tributes. Minister in the Office of the Attorney General. Mr. President, it is only right that today we pay tribute to a phenomenal woman, a trailblazer, Amrika Tiwari Reddy. On January 30, 1946, 
a remarkable soul entered this world and embarked on a journey that would leave an indelible mark on the legal and political landscape in Trinidad or of Trinidad and Tobago. In our tradition and in Hinduism, the symbol for power and energy and strength is female. In Hinduism, we believe that there is no Shiva without Shakti. In other words, the feminine aspect of power is needed for creation and completeness. Why do I mention this, Mr. President? I mention this because the role of women has definitely changed over the last few decades. Ms. Tiwari Reddy is an epitome of women empowerment, especially given the era in which she excelled. In an era where Lakshmi Girls Hindu College shaped the educational landscape, especially with it being the first Hindu college to be established in Trinidad. It was an era where women's rights were put on the back burner. It was an era where terms like gender equality, gender bias, and the right to education were a stranger to many. In an era where Trinidad and Tobago was approximately a year after becoming a republic, Ms. Tiwari Reddy certainly propelled women, East Indian women, and more particularly, Hindu women. She stands as a beacon of inspiration for her community work and her relentless pursuit for, social, for societal betterment. Her rise in political career and her legal career took place at a time where women felt unseen and unheard in meetings. It took place at a time where the political representation of women in parliament was few and far between. Amrika Tiwari Reddy dedicated her life to serving her country in various professional and political capacities from an early age. At just 18 years old, she was appointed as the first principal of Lakshmi Girls Hindu College. This holds great personal significance for me, Mr. President, as it is not only my alma mater, but also a place of academic legacy shared by my mother. I am proud to know that it was her leadership, vision, and dedication which played a vital role in setting the tone and direction for the institution, as well as shaping the culture and success of the school, my school. She transitioned from Lakshmi Girls Hindu College and pursued her degree in law, a decision Trinidad and Tobago would greatly benefit from. During the years 1969 to 1981, Amrika Tiwari Reddy dedicated herself to the service of our beloved country. She served in the Attorney General's chambers, beginning as a state counsel, and worked her way up to the position of Assistant Solicitor General. Ms. Tiwari Reddy also had a rich private practice, which began in 1981, focused on civil and family litigation, and greatly contributed to the shaping of legal minds of our nation as a lecturer in civil procedure and trial advocacy at the Hugh Wooding Law School. Her ever-presence in public service continued as she served as a member of the Cabinet-appointed Public Service Review Task Force and of the Council of the Bar Association of Trinidad and Tobago from, from 1982 to 1986. Justice Tiwari Reddy undoubtedly left her mark on the legal fraternity as she served as Vice President of the Bar Association of Trinidad and Tobago from 1985 to 1986 and as a member of the Disciplinary Committee of the Law Association of Trinidad and Tobago from 1992 to 1995. In her effort to influence and enact change at various levels of our society, Justice Tiwari Reddy grasped the opportunity to serve as a senator under the National Alliance for Reconstruction, the NAR, administration during the Third Republican Parliament from 1987 to 1981. This stint would see her act even as Attorney General on several occasions, 
She also served as a chairman of several select committees of the Senate. Justice Tiwari Reddy's judicial career was equally as impressive. Appointed as a puny judge in 1998, she served on the High Court. She served on the High Court until her retire in the High Court, sorry, until her retirement in, in 2011, when she was the most senior female judge on the bench. In 2012, Justice Tiwari Reddy was awarded the Shikonia Medal Gold, the second most prestigious national honor, acknowledging her many years of exemplary service to Trinidad and Tobago in the field of law. Beyond her professional achievements, Justice Tiwari Reddy was also a devoted member of the Hindu community, a founding member of the Hindu Women's Organization of Trinidad and Tobago, and a beloved radio talk show host. Her impact extended beyond the courtroom, touching the lives of all those she encountered. Even though she chose to take a step back from her role as a Hindu woman's activist upon being appointed as a judge, recognizing the importance of maintaining impartiality in the judiciary, this decision exemplified her dedication to professionalism and integrity. However, she always made sure to show her support for Hindu women in any way possible. When Trinidad and Tobago welcomed its first state-recognized female pundit, Justice Tiwari Reddy took the opportunity to deliver the feature address at that ceremony. Additionally, when she got married, she made sure to include the female pundit in the ceremony, standing alongside the male family pundit. Her courage in challenging the traditional way of doing things make me proud to stand tall as a woman, as a Hindu woman in this modern world. On April 6, 2024, Amrika Tiwari bid farewell to this world, leaving behind a legacy of excellence, compassion, and service. Her memory will forever be cherished by those who had the privilege of knowing her, and her contributions to Trinidad and Tobago will never be forgotten. The government of Trinidad and Tobago therefore offers its heartfelt condolences to the family and the friends of Mrs. Amrika Tiwari Reddy. Ma'am, you may have left us, but your spirit will continue to inspire generations to come. Rest in peace, Om Sadgati. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Lakshmidial. Respected, humble, and a trailblazer. Just a few of the descriptions used to describe a woman of class, integrity, who gave her life to public and community service. Trinidad and Tobago owes a debt of gratitude to now deceased Justice Amrika Tiwari Reddy. She was a woman I had the pleasure of meeting as a teenager who instantly impressed me with her ability to carry intelligent conversation, culturally rooted values, and to blend all of it together in the embodiment of humility and devotion to family. Her class and simplicity was something that could impress anyone in any walk of life in Trinidad and Tobago. Before becoming a very respected jurist and shattering several glass ceilings, Madam Justice Amrika Tiwari Reddy stepped forward in a brave and bold move to become the first principal of Lakshmi Girls Hindu College at the very tender age of just 18 years old. She served that institution well before moving on to pursue her career in law, being called to the bar of the United Kingdom in 1968 and one year later being called to the bar of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Justice Tuari Reddy, who also resided in Canada for a short period of time, had also been called to the bar of British Columbia and practiced in that jurisdiction for a period of time. Madam, tu Madam Justice Tuari Reddy gave a life of service 
serving for 12 years in the office of the Attorney General, moving from the position of State Counsel and leaving that office as an Assistant Solicitor General. Thereafter, she had a very reputable, well-known uh, private practice um, in which she served members of her community. Whilst maintaining her private practice, Justice Tuari Reddy was also known for her work in community service. During the period of 1987 to 1981, she broke several gender and cultural barriers, becoming a senator, government senator, under the administration of the National Alliance for Reconstruction. During that period of time, she had the distinction of becoming one of, or becoming the first woman to act in the role of Attorney General, something that we have grown accustomed to, but in those days, it was something of a novelty, and it was truly a distinction and an honor that she will carry for all of eternity. Between the period of 1998 to 2011, Justice Amrika Tiwari Reddy served as a puny judge of the high, of the, in the judiciary of Trinidad and Tobago. Those who had the distinction and the privilege of practicing before her remember her as a very fair, measured, always simple, elegant, well-spoken jurist, someone who believed in the administration of justice. Justice Tiwari Reddy fought for change. She did not believe that judges should not be permitted to practice when they uh, uh, demitted office. She asked for improvements in the terms and conditions for judges, always being a fierce advocate for what was right and what she believed to be in the best interest of the institutions of the state, having served at so many of them. Justice Tuari Reddy not only made time for public service as a judge, but also served and continued to serve after her retirement at the Trinidad and Tobago Fair Trading Commission, being, a, again, trailblazing in an area of law that is not commonly known or many persons are not well versed in, in that area of competition law, seeking, of course, to promote best practices within our beloved republic. In terms of her private life and her cultural activities, she was a founding member of the Hindu Women's Association, as well as a member of the Hindi Foundation, the Hindi Nidhi group in Trinidad and Tobago, promoting, of course, the, um, the use and the pre preserving the Hindi language amongst um, descendants, persons of East Indian descent, and promoting the use of Hindi within our common dialect and in other ways within Trinidad and Tobago. For all of her efforts and for living a life of service, Justice Amrika Tiwari Reddy was a, a recognized with the second highest award in Trinidad and Tobago, the Shikonia Medal Gold, in 2012 by the People's Partnership Government. She was always known for her humility, her professionalism, her grace, and her dignity. Although she was not a biological mother, everyone can describe and speak to the motherly way, including many of her family members, her siblings, her nieces, and her nephews, who remember her nurturing uh, disposition and the way she cared for all those around her. Today, on behalf of the opposition bench in this Senate, where Justice Amrika Tiwari Reddy once stood tall and brave, representing women at a time when women were so underrepresented in both the political and legal arenas, we say that we wish, we know that her legacy will continue to inspire greatness amongst young women and particularly those who wish to step into the field of politics. We are grateful to her for a life of service. We are grateful to her for being such an exemplar. We are grateful to her family for sharing her with this country. And we wish to offer them our heartfelt condolences as they grieve the loss of a, such an extraordinary individual. May her soul attain moksha and may her, she continue to shine in her legacy for Trinidad and Tobago as a woman of greatness. Thank you very much. Senator Thompson, I. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Sagramson Suklal has said it all about Justice Tiwari's stellar career. Senator Lachmi Dial Ramdial has spoken as well. So coming at the end of the pecking order, what am I to say? 
I speak what is personal. And I start by saying, taking a, um, modifying a quote, to say to be born a lady is an accident. To die one is an accomplishment. I am very grateful for the privilege of having known Justice Tiwari. I met her when she first entered private practice. Soon after she entered private practice, I myself joined in 1982, and she had been there the year before. And I'm grateful to her because, and I've learned a lesson from her, to be kind to inexperienced counsel. Not always young counsel, but inexperienced counsel. Because seniors, especially to women, aren't always very kind, Mr. President. And I remember some of the female lawyers not being happy with me because I did not suffer through the period of diffidence because of my background. But you know, you can always, I, I always turn to her and I was able to speak with her. If I had a question, she was always there. And I always thought of her as someone with whom I had an affinity. Because like me, and I don't think I'm mistaken, our, both of us had our neighbor string buried in Sangwa. So we were the Sangwa people. And um, I remember sometimes going home and looking to see if I would see her in her porch in this, near to the Quasi, so I could wave to her. She contributed a lot to the profession. And if one were to describe her, I would describe her as the epitome of grace, charm, and generosity. When I hear the song, I don't know if it's a hymn, one may call it, Gentlewoman. And I want to sing it, but I fear that you may stop me, Mr. President. Gentlewoman, quiet light, morning star, so strong and bright. Gentle mother, peaceful dove, teach us wisdom, teach us love. I think of Amrika Tiwari. I last saw her on the 1st of December, 2023. I was at the Bar Law Association dinner and awards function, minding my business, and I looked across at two tables beyond. And I say, that is Amrita? And I jumped up from the table. And I went across to her. And we greeted each other like long lost sisters. And I was surprised to see her with the walking stick. And she stood with me and related to me a history of the illness that she had been going through. I had no idea, because whenever I saw Mandavi and I would ask about her, I don't remember hearing that Amrita had been ill. So when I saw her and she related to me how she had been hospitalized and how she had been suffering, I really felt it in my heart. But yet I was shocked when I learned of her death. She was a wonderful, wonderful person with one of the most beautiful voices that I've ever heard. I loved her dearly. And I know that she's gone to a place where she deserves to have a good rest. I never told her that I loved her, but I did love her. And I really appreciated everything that she did for me personally. And I'm sure that she would have done as much kindness, especially to the women in the profession. Thank you for the opportunity of speaking. Honorable Senators, I too would like to pay tribute to Justice Amrika Tiwari Reddy, appointed a government senator in the National Alliance for Reconstruction Administration during the Third Republican Parliament from 1987 to 1991. Justice Tiwari Reddy lent her legal expertise to several parliamentary committees on which she served, including the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee and various select committees of the Senate. 
Justice to Ari Reddy's interests were indeed multifac multifaceted, and her career speaks to this professional versatility. She helped to build this country's legal profession by occupying several roles, including Assistant Solicitor General and then Puny Judge. Recognition of her contributions to the development of the legal sphere was solidified in 2012 when she was awarded the Shikonia Medal Gold. Honorable Senators, not only was she deeply involved in law and jurisprudence, Justice Tuari Reddy also poured her energies into various other noble endeavors. She served as a secondary school principal, a founding member of the Hindu Women's Organization of Trinidad and Tobago, and a talk show host of a popular radio program entitled Punchayat. Indeed, Justice Tuari Reddy wore several hats with grace, skill, and success, for which she will be gratefully remembered. On behalf of myself, my family, and all the members of the Senate gathered here today, I wish to extend sincerest condolences to the family of Justice Amrika Tiwari Reddy during their time of bereavement, and I pray that the Almighty grants him peace during this trying time. I now ask that we stand and observe a minute of silence as a mark of respect. May her soul rest in peace. Honorable Senators, an appropriate letter will be sent to convey our condolences to the family of the late Justice Amrika Tawari Reddy. Honorable Senators, please join me in welcoming to this Senate the families of the members of the Diplomatic Corps who are seated in the public gallery. Welcome. Bills brought from the House of Representatives on the supplemental order paper. The miscellaneous provisions administration of justice bill 2023 in the name of the Attorney General. Petitions, papers. Leader of Government Business. Mr. President, I have the honor to lay on the table the following papers as listed on the order paper in the names of the Minister of Finance, the Attorney General, the Minister of National Security, the Minister of Public Utilities, the Minister of Labor, and the Minister of Social Development and Family Services. The Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority Extension of Period No. 2 Order 2024. The Public Procurement and Disposal of Public Property Simplified Procurement Regulations 2024. The Reports of the Auditor General of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago on the Financial Statements of the College of Science, Technology and Applied Arts of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial years ended September 30, 2009 and 2010. The report of the Auditor General of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago on the financial statements of the Proceeds of Crime Act, Chapter 1127, Seized Assets Fund Account for the year ended September 30, 2023. The audited financial statements of the Water and Sewage Authority for the years ended September 30, 2021 and 2022. 
the annual report and audited financial statements of the First Citizens De Depository Services Limited, formerly First Citizens Asset Management Limited, for the financial year ended September 30, 2023. The annual report and audited financial statements of the Heritage and Stabilization Fund of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year ended September 30, 2023. The audited report and the audited financial statements of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year ended September 30, 2023. The report on the management of the Seas Assets Fund for the financial year ended September 30, 2023. The 13th Annual Report of the Police Complaints Authority for the period October 1st, 2022 to September 30th, 2022. The 2017 and 2018 Annual Reports on the Operations of the National Forensic DNA Data Bank Custodian Unit. The Annual Administrative Reports of the National Maintenance Training and Security Company Limited for the year ended December 31st, 2015. The submission to the competent authority of ILO Convention Number 191 and ILO Recommendation Number 207 concerning safe and healthy working environment, consequential amendments, and ILO Recommendation Number 208 concerning quality apprenticeships. The response of the Office of the Attorney General and the Ministry of Legal Affairs to the first report of the Joint Select Committee on National Security on an inquiry into the criminal justice system in Trinidad and Tobago to determine strategies to achieve greater efficiency and effectiveness. And the ministerial report and the ministerial response of the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services to the first report of the Joint Select Committee on National Security on an inquiry into the criminal justice system in Trinidad and Tobago to determine strategies to achieve greater efficiency and effectiveness. Reports from committees. Senator the Honorable Reginald Lamore, SC. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the following report as listed on the supplemental order paper in my name. The interim report of the Special Select Committee of the Senate appointed to consider and report on the miscellaneous provisions trial by judge alone bill 2023, fourth session 2023 to 2024, 12th Parliament. Thank you. <clears throat> President, I have the honor to present the following report as listed on the supplemental order paper in my name. The interim report of the Joint Select Committee appointed to consider and report on the representation of the People Amendment No. 2 Bill 2020, fourth session, 2023-2024, 12th Parliament. Urgent questions. Senator Mark. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. To the Minister of Health, can the Minister indicate whether an independent investigation will be launched to determine what the NICU infection prevention and control protocols were breached that resulted in the deaths of seven babies between April the 4th and 7th at the Port of Spain General Hospital. Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, from the onset, may I once again extend most sincere condolences to the families of those seven babies. Um, in the statement I read out to the lower house on Friday, I did indicate that an independent investigation will be launched. To that end, the Ministry of Health has already engaged the Pan American Health Organization to do the same. I thank you very much, sir. 
Senator Mark. Yeah. Mr. President, can I ask the Honorable Minister, this independent investigation by PAHO, can the Minister indicate to this Honorable House the composition of this team from PAHO, which he claims is an independent team? Minister of Health. As this, well, I wouldn't say customary, but what PAHO has requested is the information that we have. Based on the information that we have, then they will determine the composition of the team to look into the specific areas of concern. So we don't have the composition as yet. It depends on the information and data we send to them, and then they will determine what areas of specialty or concern and appoint the appropriate persons. Senator Mark. Can I ask the Minister of Health, having regard to the doctrine of ministerial accountability and responsibility in the context of the passing of these seven babies under tragic circumstances, whether he is prepared to tell this Parliament when he will be tendering his resignation to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Can I ask the Minister that question? No, you can't. That question is not allowed, Senator Mark. Next question on the order, paper. To the outgoing Minister of Health. Oh, I think Senator that... Mark. You should I, I, is that, I, think, I think that is Senator Chanti. Oh, Senator Lakshmi, the sorry, sir, sorry. Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. To the Minister of Health, can the Minister advise whether the parents of the seven babies who died at the NICU at the Port of Spain General Hospital has been provided with the medical notes and rec records as requested from the said hospital? Minister of Health. Thank you very much. Yes, to Senator Lakshmi Dial and the wider public, I am advised by the officials at Northwest RHA those files are currently, as we speak, being copied, and hopefully the parents will have their copies by the end of the day or by tomorrow for the latest. That is what my advice is. Thank you, Mr. President. Through you, has the Ministry of Health intervened since becoming aware of the situation that occurred, given that up to 4 p.m. yesterday there was no response to the pre-action correspondence that has the ministry intervened to ensure that there has been no tampering, altering, or destruction so, Senator of the Lachmedia, medical records? I'll, that I'm hearing about two or three questions Sorry. inside there. You need to truncate that and, and be very succinct in the question that you're asking. Has, has the Ministry of Health intervened or taken any action to ensure that there has been no tampering, altering, or destruction of the medical notes which has occurred to ensure that the records are preserved and properly presented to the parents given the, the effluxion of time since the request has been made? So that question does not arise, Senator Lachmedial Ramdial. Next supplemental. Given that, as been reported in the newspaper, the parents have also requested that records dating back as far as January 2024 in relation to deaths that have occurred at the NICU. Is the Ministry of Health prepared to intervene to ensure that this information is disclosed and provided to the parents? Minister of Health. Whatever information needs to be disclosed on the advice of the attorneys will be disclosed. Senator Mark. Thank you. To the Honorable Minister of Education, in light of death threats made to teachers and students of the Barakpo East Secondary School, can the Minister provide a status report on any investigation into these threats? Leader of Government Business. Mr. President, in every instance of threats being leveled against any school, which is happening too often in our society, the Ministry of Education seeks the immediate guidance and involvement of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. The Ministry of Education cooperates fully 
provides all pertinent information and operationalizes any and all security plans and advice received. With respect to the investigations, however, such matters fall squarely within the remit of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service and not the Ministry of Education. And the Ministry of Education is not authorized to speak on behalf of any investigative details. The Ministry of Education continues to work closely with the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service to ensure the security and safety of all students and staff members at all of our nation's schools. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Mark. Mr. President, may I ask you, to, through you today, Honorable Minister, why, Honorable Minister, in light of these grave threats to life, limb of the life and limb of students and teachers, that the Ministry of Education has not taken any measures to shut down these, this particular school in order to safeguard the lives of both students and teachers. Leader of government business. Mr. President, as I took care to carefully enunciate and illuminate, the Ministry of Education cooperates fully and provides all information and operationalizes any and all security plans and guidance received from the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service that applies in the instance of this threat and any other incident related within the education sector. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Mark. In light of the fact that the Ministry of Education received the death threat from the police. Since Sunday, could the minister indicate, in light of receipt of that particular threat, what action, if any, was taken by the ministry to ensure that children and teachers were not present at the school on Monday and on Tuesday, respectively. Can I ask, Mr. President, through you to the Honorable Minister to clear the air on this matter? Minister. Mr. President, that has already been responded to. The Ministry of Education has operationalized and will continue to operationalize all the security plans and guidance as received by the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. All measures have already been taken with response to this particular incident and other similar incidents. In the particular circumstance, threats were received via email, which were taken seriously. A series of actions were undertaken, and the Ministry of Education is not authorized to deliver any details on the substance of those ongoing investigations. Thank you, Mr. President. Questions on notice, questions for oral answer. Leader of Government Business. Mr. President, with respect to questions for Oral response, the government is prepared to answer questions number 27, number 41, number 53, number 55, number 88, number 89, number 90, number 91, number 93, and number 94, which is 100% of the questions for oral response on the order paper. Questions for written response. The government is prepared to circulate answers to questions number 91, sorry, to questions number 81, number 82, number 83, number 85, 
and number 86, and we request a deferral of two weeks on question number 64 for written response. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> So, Leader of Government Business, the deferral that you're requesting on that particular question has already been deferred at an earlier stage. Senator Mark, you had something to say? Yeah, on, um, I can't remember the exact, I think it's 27, Standing Order 2716. I seek to invoke Standing Order 2716 of the Senate Standing Orders in respect of question number 64, Honorable President. Okay, so Senator Mark, your request is so noted, and that standing order will be actioned. Thank you, sir. Senator Mark. Yes. Yes, thank you, Honorable President. Yeah, um, Honorable President, question number 27 to the Minister of National Security. Minister of National Security. Thank you very much, Mr. President. The use of firearms by prison officers is guided by the Firearms Act, Chapter 1601 as amended, and the Trinidad and Tobago Prison Services Firearms Policy as outlined by General Order No. 91 of 2016. This policy sets out the prison services firearm users protocols, which governs inter alia procedures for storage of firearms and ammunition issued to prison officers while at work at their respective residences during travel and when conducting their affairs and carrying firearms in public. With respect to the particular social gathering, quote unquote, as suggested by the Senator, it should be noted that based on information received from the Commissioner of Prisons, the event was an internal, pre-planned prison officers only, and in one case, an authorized person It was that type of affair that was held in a secluded, limited access, high security zone that had undergone a thorough security sweep prior to its occupation by prison officers on that occasion. Mr. President, I thank you. Senator Mark. Mr. President, having regard to the response given by the Minister of National Security. Can the Minister indicate, given this thorough security sweep that took place, can the Minister explain why these firearms belonging to the Trinidad and Tobago Prison Service were seen hanging from a tree during the said social gathering if all this security sweep was conducted, Mr. President. Can the minister indicate why this thing went viral and Trinidad and Tobago saw these two weapons and so on on display? Minister of National Security. It is precisely for the reasons as I have stated that it was possible for an individual in possession and control of a firearm to have placed it close to him. Of course, what the society saw was a, uh, an element of a video that someone might have shared. But at all times, Mr. President, that firearm, those firearms were in the control of the officers to whom they were lawfully issued. Especially given that possession can be actual and or constructive. 
but control nonetheless. Senator Mark. <clears throat> Mr. President, given the clear breaches that have occurred and the confession made by the Honorable Minister to this Honorable Senate, can the Honorable Minister indicate whether the government intends to launch an independent investigation into this matter, Mr. President? Minister. Mr. President, I really fear, I perish the thought of, 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 of descending into banality. I have given a clear answer. I know where the Senator operates, but I have given a very clear answer, and his suggestion is therefore as invalid as the thoughts that drive them. Thank you. Senator Mark. Yeah. Mr. President, this is a very serious, in light of this development in which the protocols governing firearms were breached, can the minister indicate to this Honorable Senate whether any action has been taken to deal with the particular individuals whose firearms were clearly on display in contravention to well-established protocols. <laughs> Mr. President, the, the suggestion by the Honorable Senator is bold. The Senator is calling for an investigation and in the same breath is telling this Honorable House that there was a breach. You see why I am afraid of banality, Mr. President? I could say no more. Uh, of incompetency. Uh, That's what you're afraid of. Yeah. Senator Mark, ask a yeah, question. Yeah. Mr. President, you understand why this country is in the state that it is in today under this Senator. rudderless, leaderless Senator Mark. minister? Senator, Senator Mark, have a seat. You have a final supplemental on this question. Please ask it. With due respect, I would ask this minister to leave this chamber, and I will proceed to the next question. Members, members, members. Senator Mark, as you are well aware, the authority to do such lies with me and only with me. I will ask you, I will, Senator Mark, I will ask you again. You have a fourth supplemental? Ask it. No supplemental. Next, next question on the order paper, Senator Mark. I propose what I did. Next question on the order paper. Yes. Mr. President, is it question number 41, sir? Yes, that's yes, right. Thank you. Question number 41 to the Minister of Energy and Energy Industries. Minister of Energy and Energy Industries. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, all of NGC's directors, including its chairman, are paid fees and allowances in accordance with the State Enterprises Performance Monitoring Monitor Manual. As a result, NGC's chairman is paid the following fees and allowances in relation to the A and C companies, which make up the NGC group of companies, and in respect of which he has been appointed to serve as chairman. Three A companies, $10,000 a month, travel allowance of $1,000 per month. 13 C companies, fees, $6,500 a month, $1,000 a month travel allowance. With respect to part two of the question, the total amount of money spent on the chairman's overseas travel by the NGC, its subsidiaries, and associated investment companies since his appointment, is $30,414.09 US currency. With respect to the third part of the question, the chairman of the NGC is a holder of a doctorate in business management from the Australian Institute of Business and a master's degree in business administration from the Henley Management College in United Kingdom, 
among numerous other professional certificates and diplomas from respected institutions in engineering, project management, and other fields of expertise. He's also a member of the Project Management Institute, which is the world's most recognized project management certification, and a fellow of the American Academy of Project Managers. His full list of qualifications will be circulated to the honorable members of this house. Mr. Mark. Yes, um, through you, Mr. President, can I ask the Minister of Energy and Energy Industries if he can provide the Senate with a breakdown of the travels of this honorable gentleman during the period under review? He, we got a breakdown of some, I think he said was, is it 30 or 80? 30. 30,000 US So you want a dollars. further breakdown yes. of what he stated? Yes, the Honourable Minister <coughs> can share that with us. Minister. The answer is yes, that can be provided. Senator Mark. <coughs> um, Minister, can you provide, as we are in this chamber, a tight summary of the overseas travels of this uh, gentleman? Yes, I can. For NGC, there was travel to Barbados on the 5th of June, 2023, an in-country board meeting, which is required in accordance with the Barbados Company's law. That was 699 US dollars. Under NGC, again, there was travel to Amsterdam between the 10th to the 12th of July, 2023, for the IA2 conference, 2023, that was 12,877 US dollars and 72 cents. For PPGPL, there was a visit to Phoenix Park and Energy Marketing LLC office, which is an American company that PPGPL acquired the ownership of, that is doing quite well. He went to visit the staff at the Hull ter Terminal and a meeting with cl key clients with a view to negotiating the amicable resolution of a potential claim that cost US $2,727. There was a visit to Phoenix Park Energy Marketing Limited, again, another entity acquired in the United States as part of the diversification by the NGC group outside of Trinidad and Tobago. That was done, and that cost $4,047 US dollars and 96 cents. For national energy, there was travel to Guyana for an in-country board meeting required in accordance with the company's law of Guyana for $1,925.59 US dollars. Travel to Suriname for engagement with government representatives with a view to establishing cross-border synergies and pursuing renewable energy project opportunities. Again, diversification by the group for US $2,493.39. Then there were the energy conferences in both Guyana and Suriname. For Guyana, it was $3,704.37 US dollars and for the energy conference in Suriname, $1,939.06 U.S. dollars. Can you advise this honorable Senate in the government's thrust towards <laughs> diversification? Can you tell us in the United States, as you mentioned, can you share with us what tangible benefits we have been able to realize thus far from these efforts? Thank you very much. Minister of Energy. Thank you very much for the opportunity. The NGC Group's two recent acquisitions, recent being, if I remember correctly, from the year 2019, under PPGPL, have been what we call NGL acquisitions, and in particular, the acquisition of a hull and terminal that deals with the distribution of LPG from the United States down into the markets, not only of the United States, but also of Mexico. The other terminal as well, the second investment, is related to that, and these two investments into the United States economy that are now supplying both the United States as well as Mexico are providing the group through PPGPL with foreign exchange earnings, growth, and opportunities outside of Trinidad and Tobago. 
and they are both direct successes of this government's efforts with the NGC group to diversify outside of Trinidad and Tobago. This is how this government has invested the money of the people of Trinidad and Tobago through NGC, as opposed to utilizing a billion dollars in cash for the Beetham Wastewater Plant and funding of SIS, which is a well-known UNC financier. $10 million Senator dollars, Mark. Minister, Senator has engaged yet? Senator Mark. Sorry, sir. Uh, I thought have a seat, calling. have a seat, have a seat. Ministers. Senator Mark, in order to ensure that there's efficiency in this process, I would advise once again, just stand and ask your supplemental. Can I proceed to my other? This is the fourth supplemental on this question. No, 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 I'm going to. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Question number 53 to the Minister of Energy and Energy Industries. Minister of Energy and Energy Industries. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, this question is in relation to the, rest the successful restructuring of Atlantic LNG, which was concluded in December 2023. And I hasten to add, it has never been done anywhere else in the world, but this government achieved it. After five years of negotiating on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago, and the answer to the specific questions are, as follows, as has been stated previously on several occasions, the commercial terms of the Atlantic Trains 2, 3, and 4 agreements and corresponding off-take contracts are subject to non-disclosure agreements as is customary in the energy sector and cannot be disclosed. Mr. President, for the people of Trinidad and Tobago to understand, if we were to disclose the pricing formulas and the structures of Atlantic LNG, it would immediately make Trinidad and Tobago's Atlantic LNG platform and complex uncompetitive in the world because the LNG is a global energy sector where there is constant competition for pricing and to secure contracts of supply. The second part of the question, the answer is the Atlantic Train 2, 3 merger with Train 1 comes into effect this year in October 2024. And the third part is the initial shareholding of NGC, had the government not done the restructuring, would have been 5.7%, because we had 10% in train one, 11.2% in train four, nothing in two and three. This government of Trinidad and Tobago successfully negotiated across the whole board, trains one, two, three, and four, we will now have a 10% shareholding achieving a shareholding of an additional 4% at no cost to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And that is one of the benefits of the restructuring of Atlantic LNG for the future generations of Trinidad and Tobago. Senator Marx. Mr. President, may I ask this distinguished traveling, well, uh, uh, this distinguished minister. Can I ask this distinguished minister? What sellout arrangements did the government engage in to move from 5.7% to the 11% ownership of the so-called new restructuring of the Atlantic LNG? Could you tell this country what sellout arrangements you had to engage in to move from 5.7%. You can't stand. Minister of, Energy. Standing. Minister of Energy. Have a seat, Senator Mark. Minister yes. of Energy. Thank you very much. Mr. President, it may surprise those on the other side, including Senator Mark, to know that this government did engage in absolutely no sellout. This government, starting with the Energy Spotlight conference that was held in 2018, declared to the major shareholders of Atlantic LNG, BP and Shell, that we wanted an increase in value for the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. We then embarked on five very difficult and complex years of commercial negotiation, where we achieved not only better pricing, not singularly linked to Henry Hub, which today is at $1.71, whereas we are getting over $3. 
an increase of over 40% to 50%. We also got third party access to gas and an additional shareholding for the people of Trinidad and Tobago, not for as much as a dinner mint, unlike what happened with NGC between the 2010 to 2015 period, where the UNC specifically chose constituencies which to use SIS to build recreational grounds, to build the Weatham Wastewater Plant, to take $16 billion of cash for the people of Trinidad and Tobago out to fulfill their fantasies and their political ambitions, which led to a loss in 2015, where thankfully the people of Trinidad and Tobago returned return sense and sensibility in a PNM government and are today deriving the direct benefits of a competent, uncompromised, uncorrupt government, the People's National Movement, unlike those on the other side, who that is what their tenure shows. Senator Mark. Given the sellout, given the sellout of the national interest by this corrupt, incompetent administration, Mr. President, I want to ask this distinguished gentleman. Senator Mark, Senator Mark, distinguished. have a seat, have a seat. So, the supplemental questions being asked and the responses being given are starting to get a tad bit aggressive. So I'm going to ask both sides to take it down a notch and get back to the procedure at hand, which is ask your supplemental succinctly, and on my right, respond to the supplemental succinctly. Continue, Senator Mark. Yes, Honorable President, may I ask the distinguished gentleman, Member of Parliament for Port Spin North, St. Anne's West, whether the government that was supposed to get back some $100 billion from BP and Shell because of the transfer pricing mechanism which robbed this country according to Senator Mark, reports. what is the question? What is the question, the Senator question Mark? Is, this gov can the minister indicate why did this government fail to receive from that those two companies, Shell and BP? So, Senator Mark, you don't even need to finish the question. That question does not arise. Do you have another supplemental? Yes. Mr. President, the sellout of the interests of this country. Let me just ask the Honorable Minister. Can the minister confirm or deny that in their sellout arrangement they actually extended the license of the Atlantic LNG, which had expired, to 30 years and to give them another 15 years, so Senator Mark, which will give them again, 40 again, years. Have a seat, have a seat. Can the minister confirm have or deny? Have a seat, Senator yes. Mark. Yes. Again, Minister of Finance. Senator Mark, please make your question succinct. There's too much rambling in between the actual question itself. Thank you. Mr. President, I'm guided by your ruling. Can I ask the Honorable Minister the, the sellout arrangements that have taken place? Can the Minister confirm or deny whether the government granted Atlantic LNG an extension of its license which expired for 30 years and in the agreement agreed to an additional renewal of 15 years, giving Atlantic LNG a total period of 40 years to further exploit the resources of Trinidad and Tobago. That is the question we want to put to the Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, the restructuring of Atlantic LNG is obviously to give further life to Atlantic LNG. So, for example, Train 1, the liquefaction license, expired in 2018. So that brings to an end Train 1 unless it is extended. Additionally, Trains 2 and 3, 
The license, the original license expires in October of this year. So is it that the UNC's energy policy is to let two, trains two and three just wither away and not continue when there's a lot of life left in it? Beyond, well, what this government did is restructured it. And yes, we have granted extensions, but with additional revenue terms, additional shareholding, additional access to third party gas, and a better structure for the people of Trinidad and Tobago, for Atlantic LNG, which will continue to provide for the future generations of Trinidad and Tobago well into the future and not expiring in October of this year. And that is, once again, the competence and the confidence of a PNM government in the energy sector doing what is right to ensure for the future generations. Your paper. Is it, I have another supplemental, sir? No, that's four. <laughs> and I have three. I have one more. I've Next question on the order. My God, I'm very disappointed. Very disappointed. I wanted to deal with that sellout minister. Yeah. Okay, sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. I apologize. No, have a seat. Have a seat. I'm, I'm not inclined to continue raising to my legs to bring this procedure back to order. So as far as I'm concerned, until the end of oral questions, walk a thin line. Mr. President, Standing Order 46.6, he referred to my colleague as a sellout minister. In other words, he personalized it. He's imputing improper motives. Mm -hmm. I would ask that he withdraw it and apologize. So, Senator Mark, again, the Standing Order 46.6 is indicated as imputing improper motives of the use of that particular phrase. I would ask you to refrain from using that phrase going forward. Use a phrase on this Center Mark. Center Mark. Have a seat. Have a seat. Make this the last time I'm on my legs for this. Ask a question. Thank you, Honorable President. Which question, sir? 55. Yeah, thank you, sir. <laughs> question number 55 to the Minister of National Security. Minister of National Security. Thank you yet again, Mr. President. The Trinidad and Tobago Police Service has never engaged in any such dialogue. It follows, therefore, that the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service has never informed the government of Trinidad and Tobago that any such dialogue was undertaken by the TTPS. It would also follow that the government could not endorse any such action. In addition, the government of Trinidad and Tobago has never suggested to the TTPS that this should be a considered approach as government policy. The government of Trinidad and Tobago expects the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service to continue to develop strategies in responding to the crime problem and other crime management issues within the country. The Trinidad and Tobago Police Service has produced several strategic plans over the years, the latest being the plan of 2022 to 2024. This strategic plan guides the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service in treating with existing administrative and operational issues. In addition, the 2023 Violent Crime Reduction Plan, VCRP, was designed to direct response to rising levels of illegal firearms, as well as troubling levels of gang activity. The purpose of the plan is to reduce the fear of crime and criminality through the improved relationship between the TTPS and the communities around Trinidad and Tobago. As it pertains to gangs, one of the primary aims of the VCRP is to dismantle criminal gangs, enhance intelligence capabilities, increase detection, and to successfully prosecute violent and prolific offenders. The TTPS's plan to dismantle criminal gangs, which 
is consistent with the government's policy includes the following, conducting extensive data mining on gangs in accordance with the law, selecting the most violent gang members for gang, from the gang database in each police division and intensively targeting them, targeting the most prolific offenders, gang members, drug dealers and other notorious persons for specific action, including execution of outstanding warrants, making effective use of the anti-gang law, interception of communications act, and other relevant laws to disrupt the activities and to prosecute gang members. Assigning field, in, field intelligence officers in each police division to collect and process intelligence on criminal gangs. Operate, operate, operationalizing gang intelligence units in each police division and substantially increasing the number of officers dedicated to dismantling gangs. Applying precision-driven law enforcement and prevention strategies to those communities with persistent violent hotspots and controlling movements on our roadways and public spaces. Those, Mr. President, uh, some of the main features in the anti-gang thrust that this question quite properly focuses on. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, in light of the statement or the response given by the Honorable Minister, can the Minister indicate to the Senate why in light of the widespread publicity of this particular situation, did the government not issue a clear and categorical statement dissociating itself from any kind of negotiations between this task force of the police service and gangs, rival gangs, in the Port of Spain area? Why did the government Minister. not categorically issue a statement denying this? Mr. President, the government's policy is very clear, very highly publicized. The government didn't have to extricate itself from any such Action. The police service, led by the Commissioner of Police, made it quite clear, satisfactory enough to the government, on behalf of the people, that it did not endorse or support any such policy or action. The government's position remains abundantly clear and further clarified today in my response to the Senator. I thank you very much. Minister indicate whether he's aware that the Commissioner of Police has conducted a proper investigation into those allegations of negotiations between this task force and rival gangs in the Port of Spain area so that Trinidad and Tobago, consistent with government policy, could be very clear that this is not so, and therefore, if it is so, action is being taken by the Commissioner of Police to correct this matter. Minister of National Security. Mr. President, as alluded to earlier, the police service responded publicly to this situation following the allegations that were made. I don't know if the police service is still involved in any investigation on that or other matters. Maybe a certain deputy political leader of the UNC might be able to assist us in that regard. President, through you again, can the minister indicate whether there are rogue elements in this Port of Spain task force that are operating independently of the police commissioner as well as the Minister of National Security in negotiating with rival gangs 
in the Port of Spain area? Can the minister confirm or deny that, Mr. President? Yes. <clears throat> in the generality, it is well known that there are rogue members of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. There were rogue cabinet ministers in this country, some of whom found themselves before the court. That is quite well known to all of us in the generality. On this specific matter, however, the police services policy, the government's policy are well known and published. And if, in the generality, any member of the police service or any person goes contrary to those dictates, the dictates, the guidance of those policies, then of course, if it amounts to criminal action, criminal action will be, has been, in those circumstances taken. All of my response to the generality can't comment on the specific issue any more than I already have, Mr. President. May I thank you? Senator Mark. I, I think I've exhausted the gentleman. Senator Dr. Paul Richards. Thank you. Good afternoon, colleagues. Question number 88 to the Minister of Rural Development and Local Government. Minister of Rural Development and Local Government. Mr. President, good afternoon to the Honourable Senators and to you, Mr. President. The full proclamation and implementation of the Miscellaneous Provisions Local Government Reform Act 2022 is expected to occur over the course of the next 12 months. In this context, local government bodies are, in fact, being continuously assessed to determine their readiness for implementation of the new system, and all appropriate action is being taken to strengthen, reform, and upgrade the bodies to handle their new role and responsibilities. Thank you. Senator, Senator so, Richards. To you, Mr. President. Have any challenges, major or otherwise, being identified by local government bodies in preparation for this new local government legal regime? Minister. I thank the honorable member. Um, this is a comprehensive package of amendments, and the, there are, of course, challenges afoot. None of them are out of the norm or unexpected. Uh, the areas of concern involve simple capacity arrangements, space, financing, and structures. What's important is that the plant and machinery, the people and the process to go with the reform implementation has been mapped out and identified and those structures are being transferred from certain areas to other areas or improved across the base. I regret that the answer is as open and as large as I've given without specifics. It's because the area itself is such a large area of reform. Thank you. Through you to the Minister. Given that the, there has been much discussion about the local government reform bill and its purported benefits to the people of Trinidad and Tobago and the fact that property tax collection for residential properties is linked to that, can the minister be more specific about the evolution of this proclamation, given that the, the burgesses who are in the process of paying property tax are going to expect benefits in, in less than the 12-month projection that you've identified? Minister. I remind that there's an annual budget cycle and the Minister of Finance, in fact, provided already in this year's budget for an allocation to come from the Consolidated Fund for property taxes. So in a sense, the government has already put money for property tax from the coffers of the, con of the Consolidated Fund. With the proclamation of the methodologies to collect property tax, of course, those things will come in to supplement that position. There's been a reduction, a one-third reduction in property taxes, but to encourage the implementation, that's where local economic development is aggressively going on as we speak in the construction of local economic boots, business development units, new projects, new products, and those things are rolling out in the course of the actual financial year as we speak. So those are ongoing, already part of the reform package, being delivered as we speak, and the fruits of those will come during the course of the execution of this year's PSIP and IDF. As we get those movements, you will begin to see the fruit of that on the field. Senator. Thank you. Final question, Minister. Given the fact that many, if not most, local government bodies have been notoriously derelict 
in supplying audited financials and now they're being afforded the opportunity to collect funds to the benefit and the interest of the burgesses. Have there been any training or stronger oversight financial mechanisms being instituted in these local bodies to ensure that the monies being collected uh, are not misused and they actually do redound to the benefit of the burgesses? Yes, sir. Very grateful for the question. As a matter of fact and law, the Finance Act, December 2023, put the collection of property tax in the hands of the Board of Inland Revenue as and until the Minister of Finance, by order, passes that responsibility to local government. So the collection of monies is done by the Board of Inland Revenue. I will remind as well that with the full proclamation of the Public Procurement Act, there is now a completely different regime of expenditure both in how it is procured and how it is accounted for, and the Office of Procurement Regulation is therefore there. So there are very large systemic changes that have been applied already to the equation. To answer the old issue of accounts and management structures, I can see that the Ministry itself has updated all internal audits has already done the auditing and position cycles in com combination with the Ministry of Finance. So there is a completely different regime in effect right now. The past situation of no procurement law, central tenders board, PS and other limits, etc. that's all done. That does not apply today. There is a completely different regime of expenditure and management and therefore accountability. And for the record, the Ministry of Finance is collecting property tax, not the local government bodies. It is applied to the local bodies under the Finance Act of December 2023. Senator Patasa. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, through you, question number 89 to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and the Arts. Tourism, Culture and the Arts. Thank you very much, Mr. President. The National Cultural Policy covers the period 2020 to 2025. The policy was laid in Parliament on February 12, 2020. Shortly thereafter, the implementation was largely stymied by the COVID-19 pandemic. However, notwithstanding the general disruption brought on by the pandemic to the cultural sector, the Ministry continued to support and build resilience within the sector. The major initiatives and programs that were successfully implemented in line with the two thematic areas and five goals on the national cultural policy are as follows. Theme 1, national identity and cultural confidence. Goal 1, enhance cultural confidence by ensuring the participation of all in cultural development that transforms the social and economic experiences of the nation. The Ministry successfully held several cultural tourism exhibitions throughout Trinidad and Tobago. These include Treasures from the Hideaway, an exhibition of memorabilia from Dr. Slinger Francisco at the Piaco International Airport, Amazing Facts about Trinidad and Tobago at the Gulf City and Trinity Malls, and Carnival in Trinidad and Tobago at Trinity Mall. Goal two, strengthen identities, national identity, and, the sense, and a sense of belonging among all social groups. The Ministry has facilitated the hosting of cultural camps, music schools, mentoring by the masters, workshops as follows. Nine cultural camps, 252 participants, three mentoring by the masters, workshops, 41 participants, and music schools capacity building initiative, 11 participants, representing five non-governmental organizations. Theme two, harmonized and strengthened cultural environment as an enabler of cultural growth. Goal one, secure and strengthen the infrastructure for cultural diversity, preservation, participation, exchange, and expression. Upgrade and refurbishment works were conducted and are continuing at the five performance spaces and at the Royal Victoria Institute in addition, the Ministry completed work on the Desperados Pan Theatre and continues to support the development of the Trinidad and Tobago Carnival Museum. The Ministry has also supported festivals which have direct and indirect positive impact on individuals and communities. These include the inaugural World Steel Pan Day celebrations in 2023, 
the Bocas Lit Fest, North Coast Jazz, the Trinidad and Tobago Festival, Trinidad and Tobago Film Festival, and others. Additionally, during the period, the ministry participated and or facilitated the following cultural exchanges. Participation of a cultural dele delegation to the World Expo in du Dubai, United, Amer United Arab Emirates, March 10 to 11, 2023. The visit of Ms. Claudia Godoy, Brazilian photojournalist to Trinidad and Tobago. The Ministry collaborated with the High Commission of India to host Dance of India, led by Bola Pandey, during the period 4 to 7 April 2024, and in partnership with the Embassy of the People's Republic of China to stage the China Film Festival, April 11 to 14, 2024, in recognition of the 50th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between China and Trinidad and Tobago. Based on the collaborative efforts of the Ministry and its stakeholders, United Nations declared 11th August as World Steel Pan Day, and this year, the Ministry will pioneer an annual World Steel Pan Festival from August 9 to 11 to commemorate this occasion. Goal two, support artists, entrepreneurs, and industry associations in the production of high-quality output. The Ministry has provided financial assistance in the form of grants and sponsorship to stakeholders in the amount of millions of dollars annually. During the period, the Ministry ensured that the Assessment Committee for the Artist Registry was also reconstituted. This committee facilitates support for the practitioners in the cultural sector by corporate sponsors. Individuals, organizations, festivals, and creative works must be registered with the Artist Registry to enable prospective corporate sponsors to access the art and culture tax allowance. There was a total of 935 approvals to date in these categories. Additionally, the Ministry was awarded $91,700 US dollars in grants from UNESCO to build the capacity of local visual and performing arts educators, as well as upgrade the database and website of the Artist Registry of Trinidad and Tobago. The former was successfully implemented while the latter is currently ongoing and will be completed by July 2024. In March 2024, the Ministry also collaborated with the United States Embassy and the Ministry of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs in hosting an information session on the US P3 visa for local artists and entertainers seeking to perform, teach, or coach on a temporary basis in the United Minister. States. Thank you very much. Honorable Senators, the time for Oral questions has expired. I now refer you to Standing Order 2712. And as a reminder, if you just read it out, it states that questions on the order paper for oral answer, which remain outstanding at the expiration of 45 minutes, shall be answered in writing by the minister to whom the question was addressed. We shall immediately pass copies of his answer to the clerk for circulation to members at that sitting and for inclusion in the minutes of the proceedings. So, ministers who have questions still yet to be answered, you will be guided accordingly by Standing Order 2712 of the Senate. Motions relating to the business or sittings of the Senate and moved by a minister. Member business. Mr. President, having regard to the interim report of the Special Select Committee of the Senate appointed to consider and report on the miscellaneous provisions trial by Judge Alone Bill 2023, Fourth Session 2023-2024, 12th Parliament, I beg to move that the committee be granted an extension to May 31, 2024, to complete its work and submit a final report. Honorable Senators, the question is that the Special Select Committee of the Senate appointed to consider and report on the miscellaneous provisions trial by Judge Alone Bill 2023 be granted an extension to May 31, 2024 to complete its work and submit a final report. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Leader of Government Business. President, having regard to the interim report of the Joint Select Committee, Appointed to consider and report on the representation of the People Amendment No. 2 Bill 2020, Fourth Session 2023-2024, 12th Parliament. 
I beg to move that the committee be granted an extension to June 30th, 2024 to complete its work and submit a final report. Honorable Senators, the question is that a joint select committee appointed to consider and report on the representation of the people amendment number two bill 2020 be granted an extension to June the 30th, 2024 to complete its work and submit a final report. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Public business, government business, motions. Leader of government business. Mr. President, I wish to advise that there has been agreement between the benches to debate government motion number one separately and government motions numbers two and three together. I thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. President. I beg to move the following motion standing in my name. Whereas Section 13.1 of the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority Act 2021, Act Number 17 of 2021, provides inter alia that the Minister shall, by notification, subject to affirmative resolution of Parliament, appoint the Director General and such number of Deputy Directors General of the Authority as are required. And whereas the Minister of Finance has, by notification, dated the 15th of day of March 2024, appointed Ms. Patsy Latchman Atterbury to the Office of Director General of the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority, with effect from the date of her assumption of duty in that office, and whereas it is expedient to approve the notification, be it resolved that the notification of the appointment of Mrs. Patsy Latchman Atterbury to the Office of Director General of the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority be approved. Mr. President, my understanding of parliamentary practice, the standing orders, is that a debate of this nature is limited to the suitability of the person to hold the position and nothing else. The job description for the Director General of the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority is as follows. The Director General is an executive position on the structure of the Revenue Authority and shall be an ex officio member of the Board of Directors. The Director General has the dual role of institu institution building and strategic and operational leadership of the Revenue Authority. This requires the incumbent to ensure the development and implementation of high quality strategies and plans that are informed by government policy and the operating environment. The Director General therefore must ensure that the strategies and plans are aligned with short-term and long-term objectives. Some of the responsibilities and accountabilities of the Director General are as follows. The individual provides strategic, proactive and effective leadership for the authority, advises the Minister on revenue implications, tax administration and aspects of policy relating to all taxes, advises the Minister on any matter, on any matter that can affect public policy or public finances, leads the implementation of a modern revenue and tax administration system, oversees and reports to the board on the implementation of management policies as approved by the board, ensures the implementation of a code of conduct, oversees the management of the revenue authority's funds, property, and records, oversees the execution of the authority's multi-year strategic plan, an annual plan, coordinates and executes programs and projects, prepares reports to the minister on the performance of the authority, establishes strategic relationships, partnerships, and collaboration between the authority and relevant local, regional, and international bodies, 
represents the government as required in local and international fora. The minimum qualifications and experience are as follows. A master's degree or professional qualification or equivalent postgraduate qualifications in accounting, economics, law, business, public administration, or other relevant fields. Extensive experience at a senior level in the financial, economics, or business sector. Five years experience in tax or customs administration or corporate management or in accounting, economics, law, business, or public administration or other relevant fields. Demonstrated experience in driving strategic initiatives in large and complex organizations. And regional or international exposure in working with other authorities would be an asset. So before you is a motion based on the notification that I made in March of 2024, pursuant to Section 13.1 of the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority Act. And this motion is in relation to the appointment of Ms. Patsy Latchman Atterbury for the Office of Director General. Mr. President, I'm advised that the recruitment process was rigorous, and I have the pleasure of recommending this individual to the House for approval. I will now give some details of her qualifications and experience. I am not giving way. I am not giving way to you. I am not giving way. Minister, one second. You have a point of order, Senator Mark. I said so. Mr. President, 46, subsection 2 of the standing orders. My understanding is that this matter is properly before the Court of Appeal. And I think it is the matter of the TTRA, Mr. President, is properly okay, so before Senator Mark, no, the Court of the Minister of Finance, Senator Mark, have a seat. So I understand where you're going. Again, no, that standing order doesn't apply. Minister of Finance, continue. Precisely, Mr. President. That is why I, when I introduced my contribution, I said that this motion, from my understanding of the standing orders and my long experience in Parliament and my reading of May's parliamentary procedure and other books on parliamentary procedure, that this motion deals only with the suitability of Ms. Patsy Latchman Atterbury for the Office of Director General and nothing else. And her appointment as Director General is not before any court, in any place, any time, any hall, anywhere. So let me move on to the substance of this motion. Ms. Patsy Latchman Atterbury is the holder of a Bachelor of Science with upper second class honors in management studies that was awarded to her from the University of the West Indies in 1986. After attaining her Bachelor of Science degree, Ms. Latchman Atterbury moved on to join Penta Paints Caribbean Limited in 1986, where she held the position of sales representative. After that, she moved on to Johnson & Johnson Trinidad Limited in 1988, where she was appointed a brand manager, a position she held for two years until 1990. In 1990, she again moved to hold the position of brand manager, Sterling Drug Limited, a position she also held for two years. In 1992, she then moved to the post of Export Representative Bermudez Biscuit Company, Trinidad, which she held until 1996, a total of four years. From 1996 to the present day, Ms. Latchman Atterbury has held several executive positions in various companies, the first being the position of General Manager, Caribbean Brands Limited from 1996 to 1999. During this period, Ms. Latchman Atterbury was responsible for the starting up and building of this particular entity, Caribbean Brands Limited, for the purpose of distribution of products manufactured by companies in the Bermudez Group. She established the company as a formidable competitor 
and leader of merchandising trends in the local marketplace in Jamaica. She then moved to the position of general manager, Jamaica Biscuit Company Limited, from 1999 to 2007, a period of eight years. She led an executive management team and transformed the company from a leading manufacturer of one of Jamaica's staple biscuits to a manufacturing and distribution entity supplying both local and export markets. She was also instrumental while at that company in a culture shift from a bureaucratic machine to a work hard, play hard entity and changed the focus of the company from production driven to market and consumer driven. During this period, Ms. Latchman Atterbury successfully pursued her Master's of Business Administration at the University of the West Indies and was awarded her Master's degree in 2006 with distinction on top of the class. In 2007, she moved up the corporate ladder and was appointed Vice President Small, Medium Enterprises, Small and Medium Enterprises, the Bank of Nova Scotia, Jamaica for a total period of seven years. During her time at the Bank of Nova Scotia, Jamaica, she was responsible for developing, planning, and leading the design of strategic initiatives to grow the SME portfolio and positively impact the profitability of the Bank of Nova Scotia Group. She was also responsible for establishment of the Scotia Bank Chair of Entrepreneurship and the Scotia Bank Development Program as well as Scotiabank's coaching and mentorship program for SMEs. She contributed to heighten national attention on record keeping by SMEs to ensure proper management and success. Finally, as Vice President, Small and Medium Enterprises, Bank of Nova Scotia, Jamaica, she led a team in the establishment of Credit Scotia, Jamaica, a microfinance entity. In 2007, uh, Mr. President, these two honorable senators in front of me are carrying on a running commentary. It's very difficult. Okay, no need, to, no need to engage in a back and forth. Just monitor the level of voices as the minister is contributing. Continue, Minister of Finance. Thank you very much. In 2007, Ms. Latchman Atterbury was appointed Executive Vice President, Retail Banking, the Bank of Nova Scotia, Jamaica a position she held for 10 years. During this time, she had direct responsibility for developing, planning, and leading strategic initiatives to grow the retail banking share of Scotiabank and ensure customer satisfaction and retention. Her span of responsibility at the Bank of Nova Scotia in the position of Executive Vice President included the retail branch network, small business banking, mortgages, non-branch sales, microfinance, and customer service. She also led the branch network in the Bank of Nova Scotia, Jamaica, through several structural changes to ensure operational efficiency while surpassing sales targets and ensuring that operational reviews were satisfactory. In 2017, Ms. Latchman Atterbury was appointed Chief Executive Officer of Tasty Jamaica Limited a position she held until 2021. As CEO, she was responsible for the efficient and profitable ma manufacturing and distribution of the iconic tasty patties across our own robust network. She also stabilized the company's operation during the challenging COVID-19 pandemic. During this period, Ms. Latchman Atterbury commenced studies in a doctorate of business administration with the University of the West Indies. She is currently still pursuing this degree, this doctoral degree. In 2022, Ms. Latchman Atterbury was appointed Managing Director, GK Capital Management Limited, a position she currently holds. She currently has responsibility for developing the company's strategies and for overseeing the company's financial performance, investment, and other business ventures. In this position, she maintains trust relationships with shareholders, business partners, and authorities. She directs the company's operations while ensuring that GK Capital Management Limited's policies 
and legal guidelines are adopted and implemented across the organization. Based on these qualifications and her vast experience in management and her impressive academic qualifications, especially in view of her stint as Vice President, Retail Banking in the Bank of Nova Scotia, Jamaica, I unreservedly recommend Ms. Patsley Lachman Atterbury to be and hold the position of Director General Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority. She's highly qualified and extremely experienced. I beg to Honorable Senators, I shall now propose a question for debate. Whereas Section 13.1 of the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority Act 2021, Act No. 17 of 2021, provides inter alia that the Minister shall, by notification, subject to affirmative resolution of Parliament, appoint the Director General and such number of Deputy Directors General of the Authority as are required, and whereas the Minister of Finance has by notification dated the 15th day of March 2024, appointed Mrs. Patsy Latchman Atterbury to the Office of Director General of the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority with effect from the date of her assumption of duty in that office, and whereas it is expedient to approve the notification, be it resolved that the notification of the appointment of Mrs. Patsy Latchman Atterbury to the Office of Director General of the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority be approved. Senator Mark. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I think the matter at hand is an extremely important matter. In fact, I must compliment the minister. I don't do this often, but he used the, 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 the term suitability. And, and I said, but this minister is on the ball. Because here it is, Mr. President, we are talking about the equivalent of what is called the chairman of the Board of Inland Revenue. And atop the chairman is the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Finance. So the, the question that, and I want to make it very clear from the outset, I don't know the lady, the distinguished lady. I never met her. So whatever contribution I make, no aspersions are cast on this particular individual in terms of suitability. I want to make it very clear. Very, very clear to everyone. So Mr. President, here it is. The minister has read out, has shared, I should say, the job spec, the job description of the nominee that is before us. And I was taken and following what the minister was sharing with his honor of the Senate about the particular individual. But before I get into the resume, as well as the job description of this office holder. I would like the Honorable Minister in his winding up to tell this Honorable Senate whether this individual has accepted this job because you would see in the resume, Mr. President, if you have not looked at it, 
May I advise this honorable house through you that the nominee before us has been working as the managing director of Grace Kennedy Capital in the heart of Kingston, Jamaica since 2022 to the present time, Mr. President, from 2022 to the present time. So that is why I am asking the Honorable Minister to share with this Honorable Senate, because he didn't say it in his contribution. You're calling up people's name in this parliament. He's calling the name of the individual in this parliament, Patsy Lachman Atterbury. But one thing the minister has not told you, and this honorable Senate, has Patsy Lachman Atterbury, has she accepted the job. Mr. President, the minister has not told us. Secondly, secondly, I am just assuming, Mr. President, that if I am working as a managing director of a very powerful private sector company called Grace Kennedy, which is a very powerful private sector company in Jamaica, and I'm the managing director of that company, I will be getting very good terms and conditions of engagement. And that is why I have not left. That is why what is before us tells us from 2022 to the present, which means right now, as we are debating this matter, Mr. President of Director General, and this lady is supposed to fill that post. The minister did not share with this honorable Senate what are the terms and conditions of employment of this office holder. Because we are very clear, given the information that is before us, that she works as the managing director of Grace Kennedy Capital that deals with investment in Jamaica and other activities. So, Honorable President, I would ask the Honorable Minister to be a little more transparent. This is not a lodge. We are not a lodge. You might be a lodge member, but we are not in a lodge. <laughs> Just, thank you. Mr. President, all I'm saying is that we are demanding greater transparency and accountability on this matter. One, has the lady accepted the job? Well, the way I mean I'm putting it to you, you can't hear. So that's the first thing. The second thing, Mr. President, the minister owes us a responsibility to tell us whether this matter, because I heard him in the parliament on Friday last. I listened to him, because I know he's coming here for our approval. You know, and you know what he told the other place? The terms and conditions of this job still before the cabinet. They haven't determined it. So imagine, Mr. President, we have been asked to approve persons who we don't know if they have accepted. Secondly, we don't know what the terms and conditions are. And even if the minister does not want to tell us the terms and conditions, Mr. President, at least the minister could say, listen, the cabinet has accepted the terms and conditions as approved by the Minister of Finance on the advice of the CPO. So at least we here will know that that is a finished product. No information on this matter. 
Mr. President, you know this minister, when he's speaking, he wants nobody to disturb him. He always rises on a stand of order. Stand of order. I wouldn't say anything more. You are there, you are hearing him. Mr. President, I want, or I would like to ask the Honorable Distinguished Minister of Finance. I have in my possession a document which I will share with you as the President, and I will send to all my colleagues here. Where this lady on May the twenty second, I beg your pardon, May the twentieth, twenty twenty two, in Kingston, Jamaica, on behalf of Grace Kennedy, capital, signed, sealed and delivered a mutual funds contract between who? The unit trust of Trinidad and Tobago. The unit trust corporation of Trinidad and Tobago, headed by who? The chairman of the board of the TTRA, one Nigel Edwards. He's the executive Director of the Unit Trust Corporation, Mr. President, and the lady in question, Patsy Latchman Atterbury, is the managing director of Grace Kennedy Capital, and they sign on the dotted line to jointly engage in the distribution of mutual funds in Jamaica. So you know what's going on here? These are Pali Wallis. This is a conflict of interest. The chairman of the board and the director general, Mr. President, of our TTRA are doing business already behind the scene in their private capacities. So you want to tell us in Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. President, where these people are going to be responsible for 90%, may I repeat, Mr. President, 90% of our revenues. Imagine that, all our domestic taxes, all our customs and duties. And they, Mr. President, are signing and have signed a document to engage in mutual funds. Is the minister aware of this? You can't tell me to sit down, you're out of place, that it is not a plantation, and you're not a slave master. You said you are the slaves. That be a gone. We will lynch you. If you continue, Senator Ma, right, Senator Ma, no, have a seat. Have a seat. Have a seat, Senator Ma. As much as you have already withdrawn, Senator Ma, do not go down that road again. No, it's 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 no, not you, understood. Yes. Let me finish. It's not tolerable. Be very careful. Continue. Mr. President, may I seek your indulgence? I seek your protection. When I'm speaking, can I ask for you to give me protection? This running commentary that is coming from Mark. across there. All right. Have a seat. Just the have a seat. So, have a seat. Yes, Everybody has my protection once they're on their legs and contributing. I ask you to continue now. Right. So, Mr. President, all I'm saying to this honorable Senate, there appears to me, Mr. President, to be a conflict of interest. And I don't think the Minister of Finance should bring any name here 
that even before they could be seated in the chair, they and the chairman of the TTRA have already signed documents to engage in private business transactions on behalf of their companies and corporations. If they can do that before, Mr. President, before they can take up their formal appointment, what will happen when they take up the formal appointment, Mr. President? I'm just asking. I cast no aspersions. I am dealing with the interests of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And we are talking about taxes. I work very hard. And I take my money through taxes. And I don't want anybody to be taking my taxes and engaging in all kind of backroom deals. So all I'm asking, Mr. President, let us be real. Mr. Minister, withdraw this now. This lady is unsuitable. This lady is unsuitable for the job. Withdraw that particular name. Go back out and recruit again. She's conflicted. It's like promoting an officer who kidnapped an individual to the post of Deputy Commissioner of Police. That's unlawful. Mr. President, as I said, I bring these matters early to your attention. Mr. President, I looked at the resume of the individual. This person is a good juice seller. She's in the KFC business, fast food, tasty parties. Mr. President, if you look at the resume, Banking, Scotia Bank, Vice President, Executive Vice President, small business, medium sized business. Even in COVID, the, the, the resume is telling us she made plenty of profits for a company called Bermuda's and Tasty Parties and all of these people. Plenty money. I have no problem with that, Mr. President, from a private sector point of view. But you're coming into the public service, which is a different ethic, a different culture, a different responsibility, Mr. President. And I look through the, 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 the resume, Mr. President. Mr. President, I think the minister needs to wheel back and come again. Let him wheel back and come again. Mr. President, look what the minister, listen to what the minister has read. Look at the job description that is before us. Look at the responsibilities and accountabilities of this particular individual in terms of the office. Mr. President, this person is supposed to deal with the administration or enforcement of the revenue laws of Trinidad and Tobago. The revenue laws, Mr. President. Mr. President, the TTRA is an amalgam of the Board of Inland Revenue and the customs and excise. And this lady is responsible as Director General for administrating, managing, overseeing, supervising. Both customs, excise, duties, domestic taxes. Mr. President, I call, I ask any member of the Senate, including the government, go through this resume with a fine tooth comb 
and see if you see the word revenue coming up once. Go through this resume and see, Mr. President, if the word tax, domestic tax, come up once. Mr. President, this is not fit for purpose. Why are we going this our revenue authority will crash? Will crash. Because you are putting somebody who does not have any experience whatsoever in revenue collection in domestic tax administration has no experience in customs, duties, and excise. And excise. And you're putting them to be in charge of 90% of the revenues of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. President, that is a recipe for disaster in Trinidad and Tobago. I have no problem with the lady. I don't care if she's from Jamaica, Antigua, Bermuda. I don't care. Once you're competent, once you have the candidates, if this lady had the skill set, and she could have shown in the, her re resume, Mr. President, that she has administered the revenues of Jamaica for 15 years. She was there as Director General for 15 years. And we can live with that. Even though she's a Jamaican. I love Jamaicans. They are part of CARICOM. So we have no problem with a Jamaican coming here. But Mr. President, why are we going to bring somebody to be in this very sensitive position and job when they have had absolutely zero experience in tax administration. Does that make sense? I appeal to the Honorable Minister. This is not fit for purpose, Mr. President. So let me just consolidate further my arguments. You would see in the resume that is before us that the individual in question has had experience. But in the very first paragraph, of the professional profile, it tells you that the experience is in the field of manufacturing and distribution in the fast-moving consumer goods sector. That is what it's telling us here. This is the resume. It tells us, Mr. President, small business and retail banking experience in the financial sector. Look at here, small business and retail banking in the financial sector. Mr. President, it goes on to talk about operations and general management experience in local quick service restaurant, restaurant Industry, I take this to mean, Mr. President, a KFC, Subway, Royal Castle. I'm not saying anything wrong, Mr. President. This puzzle is not fit for purpose. That is what is wrong. You're talking about revenues not belonging to the Minister of Finance. These revenues do not belong to the Minister of Finance. These revenues belong to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. President. And we have to get the most competent person to administer a 
and to manage and to supervise our revenues. That is what we are talking about, Mr. President. Any mistake here is corruption. Any mistake here is destabilization. Any mistake here is pain. We can't afford to make mistakes in a period, Mr. President, when revenues are running low. We can't afford that. This is a mistake that we have before us today. So, Mr. President, I'm telling you that when you look at this thing carefully, you realize that the person is in also, Mr. President, according to this first paragraph, general management in the securities industry. Fine. Maybe the Stock Exchange. Maybe the Securities and Exchange Commission. That's fine. What does that have to do with tax administration, revenue laws, customs duties, and excise duties, Mr. President? Mr. President, not one item in the resume refers to this issue that we are dealing with. Revenues. How can we? How can we support this? I am not against the person. I'm not dealing with personalities here. So, Mr. President, you, you go through this resume again, and, 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 and you trace, Mr. President, the, the XP. Mr. President, you understand what I'm talking about? It's a running commentary. If they want to talk, they could be excused. But I am getting that feedback constantly that I seek your protection, sir. I think things have tempered down a bit, so you may continue. Yeah, so, Mr. President, all I'm saying to this Honorable Senate, through you, and you looked at it, the minister told us, Penta pains, sterling drugs, some export brand. What I found quite interesting, and maybe the minister could tell us, what is the PNM connection? Is this a PNM connection? No, I'm asking. I noticed, Mr. President, that this person seemed to have been christened. Baptized and confirmed in the Bermuda Bermuda's Biscuits Company Group. I think it's easy. Mr. President, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. President, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, I believe the Chancellor of the University is the president and the operating manager. Yeah. No. All I'm asking is. Mr. President, you cannot ask me to approve something and then try to muzzle me. You cannot tell me what to speak. You will get a chance to speak. Allow me to speak. I am the opposition. Incoming government. All right? So I will speak. You may not like what I'm saying, but I have a right to speak once the president allows me. Mr. President. So, Mr. President, what we are seeing in this document is that this lady, with the greatest respect, no aspersion, I don't know the person, has had over 20 years of experience in the biscuit business. The biscuit business. Now, I understand change management, Mr. President. That is very important. When you're talking about a new organization, and you're talking about an, or a new organizational culture, the lady, the individual, the nominee, has had that experience. It is in the resume. I have no problem with that. That's a plus. But Mr. President, 
is this lady going to be employing as Director General a consultant? Mr. President, is she going and um, posing hypothetically for your consideration and for this honorable house's consideration? If you are ignorant, if you have no knowledge of revenue administration, tax management, is this person going to use her power to hire experts who understand this job at the expense of the taxpayers of this country? So we are paying this lady 200,000, let's, as, let's assume hypothetically, Mr. President, per month. Because that lady is going to not come cheaper. Eh? She is getting a very good salary at Grace Kennedy as managing director. So if you want me, Mr. President, you pay for me. I am asking Mr. President whether this individual will have to engage experts to guide her in her job. So we get a double whammy. So what about these bright young people in Trinidad and Tobago because they are not a PNM, I'm not saying anyone is a PNM. What about these bright young people in our country who have PhDs and MSCs? Is it because they don't carry a PNM party card that they have not been looked at, Mr. President? So, Senator Mark, one, have a seat. One, the argument that you're trying to make is bordering very closely on imputation. Two, you've spent the better part of your contribution thus far making two points in relation to suitability. First being that there was a conflict of interest, and then the second being that the person is not qualified due to a lack of knowledge. Encompassed in that, you have called out many of the companies on the resume that the person has worked for, which would then put you in tedious repetition of what the Minister of Finance has said, who did the very same thing in support of the motion put forward. I would ask you now to wrap up your arguments in relation to this particular motion because you are bordering on tedious repetition. President, you know I have the greatest respect for your office. I've been there. So I understand when you tell me what you have said. Mr. President, let's look at the job description. Anyone who is occupying this office, including the Director General is coming in on contract. Mr. President, do you know this? Mr. President, I'm speaking to you. Do you know that every the Director General is a contract position for five years? And the Minister of Finance has the, has the authority, Mr. President, under the law to contract someone and then to fire someone. You have the power to come to the parliament just as though we have come today and remove the person under the law. The law gives you criteria that you can use to remove a person that the minister has appointed. So the minister is the judge, the minister is the executioner, and the minister is the juror. That is what the minister is. This is a party group. This is a party branch of the PNM. That is what it is. So Mr. President, we reject completely the politicization of the collection of revenues 
in uh, Trinidad. Point of order. And Tobago, Mr. Point Vice President. Point of order. Point of order. Mr. President. 46-1. This is not a debate about the Revenue Authority. It is about the suitability of this lady to hold the position of Director General. Full stop. The point of order is upheld. Yes. Kindly proceed. You have, you have six minutes remaining yes. in your contribution. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, the TTRA is the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority. We are dealing with three, we're dealing with one person, Director General. And we are saying that the Minister of Finance has the power under the law. Point of order, Mr. Vice President. This motion is simply about the appointment and suitability of this particular lady to hold his position. There is nothing in this motion that deals with any power of any minister to remove anybody. Irrelevance, point of order, Mr. Vice President. Senator Mark, you have been warned about that previously. I ask you to keep your arguments to the two points only as to, to the matter at hand. President, you have a copy of the job description. I ask you to put your hands on it so you can follow. I'm asking the Honorable Vice President to follow this job description. Again, in line with the Minister's intervention, suitability. Mr. Vice President, you told me I have a few more minutes to close off. But when you look at the responsibilities and accountabilities, it includes, Mr. President, Vice President, to lead the implementation of a modern revenue and tax administration system. That is what we have been told, that the individual is, Mr. President, this running commentary, what are you doing about it? So, Mr. President, I'm being disturbed. Yes, continue, Mr. Mark, it has subsided. Yeah. What has subsided? Are you hearing crosstalk anymore? Okay. okay, Mr. President, may I continue? Mr. President, I'm saying that our position on this side is very clear. We completely reject totally oppose the appointment of persons who, given the structure of the current arrangement, is going to lead one person to have total and absolute control over everything that they do. And because of the incursion by one office holder into these offices. Mr. Vice President, once again, standing order 46-1. The member knows exactly what he's doing, deliberately straying outside of the motion. Senator Mark, in your three and a half minutes remaining, I ask that you keep to the points before us. President, so we go on out to another responsibility to oversee the management of the TTRA funds, property and records. Well, would that mean that if the PNM wants my record, the Director General would be called upon to produce it? Mr. President? Mr. Mr. President, Vice President, I, standing I, I, order 46-1, a point of relevance. This, the member is persisting in irrelevance. He knows he's doing that. Senator Mark. Sen Senator Mark. Senator Mark, as much as you are, I ask that you stick to the points of the two points only that are in the matter at hand. Senator Mark. Use your minute and a half wisely. Don't allow these people to chain up anybody here. No? 
Mr. President, look, our position is very, is very clear. Yes, I said it, I'll say it again, because you can't hear. So, Mr. President, I make it very clear. We are not in support of this arrangement called the TTRA. We are not in support of what the government is seeking to impose on the people of Trinidad and Tobago. The individual that is before us, um, called Patsy Latchman um, Atterbury, is unsuitable for this particular post. post. The person is unfit for purpose. And as such, we are calling on the government to withdraw this particular nominee. This nominee is conflicted and therefore is unsuitable for the job. And therefore, Mr. President, we have made our position very clear on this matter. And the government has the majority. And let me warn them as I close. Whatever you do with your majority, we shall undo with our majority. We will get a majority, and we will undo it. So you do it now, we will undo it then. So we warn them, we serve them notice that they can do it now because they have the majority. When we get into office, we will undo it. That is what we'll do. So, Mr. President, you're clear on my position. You're clear on the UNC's position. We are not prepared to support this travesty, this travesty of our democracy and this attempt at subverting, poisoning, undermining an independent institution called the Inland Revenue, which is now converted into the TTRA. We are not prepared to do that, Mr. President. And with these few words, Mr. President, we call on the minister, roll back, wheel back, withdraw this nominee and bring someone else. Reopen the recruitment process. Get someone else, Mr. President. I thank you for the opportunity to make my contribution, Mr. President. Senator Dylan Remy. Mr. Vice President, I thank you for allowing me to make a presentation on this motion presented by the Finance Minister. Um, the appointment of Mrs. Patsy Latchman Atterbury to the Office of Director General of the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority. Mr. Vice President, this Revenue Authority has been long in coming, and there has been much discussion, debate, controversy around it. And as we know, the government's plan to introduce the Revenue Authority was challenged before the court by the Public Service Association, a claim that the court dismissed. And that judgment paved the way for where we are here today and gives us some insight as to the tenor and the tone of the environment looming over this newly constructed authority. The incoming leadership, therefore, led by the Director General, the candidate, Ms. Patsy Atterbury, Latchman Atterbury. The incoming leadership will therefore be required to lead a new organization, Mr. Vice, Mr. Vice President, in an, in an environment that will certainly, well, that may be not too welcoming. Let me not certainly, because um, there are many voices that may be loud but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the majority. I'm, I'm saying, though, that the environment may not be too welcoming. And this puts a demand on their leadership abilities and requires them to be able to, I would say, be strong in terms of communication, need to be able to build strong relationships, articulate the vision of the organization, and generally build a well, 
cohesive team, a, a, a strong and cohesive team to meet the objectives of this organization whilst achieving industry standards. It's not going to be an easy task for this new administration and would be led by the Director General. Section 14 of the Revenue Authority Act. Um, section 14, one says, subject to subsection two, the Director General shall be responsible for, A, the daily management and direction of the administration of the authority, B, daily management and direction of the functions of the authority as specified in section six, including the enforcement of revenue laws by means of civil proceedings. C, advising the minister on his own, on well now her own initiative, or at the request of the minister on revenue implications, tax administration, and aspects of policy changes relating to all taxes referred to in this schedule, any matter that could affect public policy or public finances, and any other matter that the minister considers could improve the effectiveness or efficiency of the administration or enforcement of the revenue laws, and D, collecting and processing statistics needed to provide forecast of tax receipts, studying the revenue laws and proposing to the minister such amendments as it considers appropriate thereto, so as to improve the administration of and compliance with such laws. So the candidate before us has a great responsibility. My understanding of the structure is that the, this candidate needed to have certain competencies and according to the, what the job description the minister um, um, identified, this person was supposed to have um, knowledge and skills knowledge in terms of, actually no, let me, let me ask, let me, minimum qualifications and requirements uh, of the, um, the, the Director General. Master's degree professional qualifications or equivalent postgraduate qualification in accounting, economics, law, business, public or other relevant fields. Extensive experience at a senior level, preferably in the financial, economics, business sector. Five years demonstrated experience in tax or custom administration, corporate management, or in administration or other relevant fields. And demonstrated experience in driving strategic initiatives in large and complex organizations, and strong experience in institutional capacity building. And the last point said, regional, or international exposure in working in other revenue authorities will be an asset. My understanding is that the role of the Director General will be to overall lead, but since we are dealing with two areas of revenue, and in revenue in terms of general revenue in, in the inland revenue, the, the, the work that's provided now by the inland revenue, and then the other area was in, um, in terms of customs and excise. My understanding is that the Director General would be ably, suitably guided in the individual areas by the Deputy, Gen Gen Deputy Director General as identified here. In other words, one Deputy Director General involved in, in inland revenue and revenue aspect, and then we have the other person who has experience in the Customs and Excise Division. So my understanding is that this Director General didn't necessarily have to have all the details of either customs or excise or inland rev or revenue, but they have to be able to generally overall um, be able to manage. And from what I see of the ladies, of Ms. Atterbury's um, CV, she has the relevant experiences. Subsection 13 of the Revenue Authority Act, subsection two, it says, the Director General and Deputy General, Directors General, shall be persons who have a minimum of five years experience, demonstrated experience and skill in the area of tax or customs administration, 
corporate management or areas of, such as accounting, economics, law, business, public administration, or other relevant fields, and who have a capacity to manage and direct large and complex organizations, which is exactly what they came from the job description. So it's in keeping what the JD is in keeping with the, 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 the information that came from the, directly from the Act. The candidates' working history, as already has been identified, the Bermudas Group Limited, Bank of Nova Scotia, Tasty's Jamaica, and um, GK Capital Management Limited, and all at a very senior level, and in, in my understanding is that these organizations have been very complex. The strengths, as identified in her CV, again, I don't know the lady, but the strengths as identified in her CV, having a strong entrepreneurial spirit, strategic business planning, excellent verbal, written communication skills, et cetera, excellent sales management discipline, strong commitment to performance management and leading by example, risk assessment and management, high emotional intelligence. So based on the, the CV that has been pre presented before us, the person, I think, is, is highly qualified. I note, however, Mr. Vice President, that the Director General, the candidate, has been out of Trinidad and Tobago for about um, 28 years. The last job worked from 1996 to now. And upon returning to Trinidad and Tobago for this particular post, that person will be tasked with a very grave responsibility. Undoubtedly, her years of experience in an array of work environments that she has faced and dealt with many challenges. However, I will, must ask in terms of a preparation for the ones that may come within the context of Trinidad and Tobago. And I'm saying that in the context of the fact that we are in a challenging situation where there's, as I said, so much controversy around this revenue authority. It's not that the person is going to be coming into a smooth environment. And the culture of, the, of both organizations in the past that will now be merged into one under the revenue authority, the cultures of both those organizations, my understanding, there has been a lot to be desired, a lot to be changed. So if this person is coming in an environment where the, we, we have, um, you have to be putting in literally a new culture into the environment, in an environment that where the general context is one that says, uh, this is the way we like it, and this is the way we are going to do it, that person and those persons are going to have a great challenge. And uh, so I'm saying this person the candidate seems to be well qualified in terms of the academic um, experience, academic qualifications, and may have had a lot of experience at a senior level in companies outside of our country. I'm just suggesting it would be remiss of me if I didn't mention that that person or the persons are going to need significant support from the board of the Revenue Authority and from the Ministry of Finance to ensure that they succeed in this very important new entity that we'll be having in Trinidad and Tobago. I don't know that many of us think that it would be possible. My understanding is that many people right now within the, within the, within the, within the Inland Revenue are saying that this will never happen. My understanding is that people within customs are also saying that, you know, the changes that we are talking about cannot happen in Trinidad and Tobago. This is my understanding from people talking to people within the area. It may not be true, but what I'm, I'm suggesting, and I'm suggesting that, Minister, um, Mr. Vice President, I, I had worked in the healthcare system where they try to move from the public sector into the regional health authorities a system that was fraught with issues. And I'm not too sure that we have got it right where we have made that change into the sector that is now 
which is now the regional health authorities. I'm not too sure that we've made the quantum changes that needed to be made in terms of the environment that people, that people are working in. So I'm just suggesting that if we want to, as we are saying, as people in Trinidad and Tobago, that we want our systems to be efficient, and this is the system that we are putting in place, that it will be required that the, the Director General will be re needing a lot of support to make sure that the environment in which he's functioning in Trinidad and Tobago, for her to, not for her, but for the system to succeed, a lot will be required. Mr. Vice President, the primary objective of the Revenue Authority is to optimize revenue collection. And therefore, the, um, um, the, the, the candidates, as we have as already said, would need not just the requirements in terms of the strong qualifications in terms of the academics, but they must be able to work well in terms of the a culture change that would be needed so that we are going to get the kind of systems we want into place. Um, I know we are, we are supposed to be dealing with the quote, suitability of the candidates, but I'll just put in one thing here um, in terms of, uh, I don't know whether the minister would want to just give us an idea that for, the, for this particular post that we are, um, the, the particular post of Director General, if you can have just a, a, a quick idea of the, the, the number of candidates that were had for, the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for this election, and um, just, just, just quickly, so that we will make sure, just have an idea, that in other words, that um, according to um, one of, um, or Senator Mark would have gone before, that it was not a, a, a the, the process was not tainted in any way, so that we can be sure that the candidate that we have here before us. I'm not saying that you said, he said the candidate was, was tainted, but I'm saying there, there have been questions over the, whether the, the process of the tr transparency, there may have been. I just want to get an idea of that, if that is possible. So in summary, Mr. Vice President, we have a, a revenue authority that is going to be started within the next, um, as soon as possible. And yes, I, I do take Senator Mark's comment about the question about the, 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 the package, making sure that this, the, the package that the persons have been, um, or the, this particular Director General has been given, we have not heard anything about it as yet, and as I know the Minister said in the other place, that that will be presented to us at some point in time. Um, I am just hoping that, because Min, Mr. Vice President, I would like to see whatever is put in place called the Revenue Authority succeed. And I think that the majority of Trinbegonians would like to see a system that succeeds. Because many of us have been complaining over the years that things need to change. And the fact that this is the change that is being brought before us now, and we are now nearer the transition we, have, um, we are debating now the selection of the leaders of, that, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the Revenue Authority. We, have, we know issues that will be brought again when, they, when you come to the VSEP package and whatnot for the public servants who are now within the system. We know that that is another hurdle that will have to be, um, have to be mounted, a hurdle that will have to be crossed over. So I'm just suggesting that this is a, a change a change that would require the kind of support that is necessary to see that this becomes successful. So I thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, for the opportunity to just make a couple of um, brief remarks on this motion to confirm Mrs. Patsy Dutchman Atterbury in the position of Director General of the Trinity Vigo Revenue Authority. Uh, Mr. Vice President, it's, um, you know, it's one of the things that I've observed since I've been here, um, and it's probably it's room for us to consider a change, is that whenever we have to consider these motions and appointments, particularly, 
we only have a CV in front of us. And um, when you look at in other jurisdictions, how it's done, you have confirmation hearings. And I always find uh, myself wishing that we could have um, that system in place here. Because to comment on a person's suitability to hold a very senior position within our um, agencies, authorities, and so on, um, you, you don't want to deal with what we're not here to deal with personalities. We don't simply want to deal with what is stated on a piece of paper provided to us. But we want to make inquiries into, and as the minister has said, the suitability of the candidate. And so we can only judge the candidate by what is presented to us on the CV that is circulated. And compare that CV to a job description. And I don't know that this is the most efficient or effective way for us to really make a contribution. So I just make that remark in passing that some sort of system, whether it's in a joint select committee framework or otherwise, or some sort of a hearing where someone is allowed to actually, uh, we, have, we have hearings where we, after people pick up appointments, we can interrogate them about their performance. It might be nice to be able to interrogate someone before they pick up an appointment about their suitability, and it might redound to the benefit of the country as a whole if we were able to have a system like that in place. So that's just a, a comment in passing. Having, you know, having to now look at the CV and make a comment on the suitability of the candidate, the first thing that jumps out, I think, and which we've already identified, is that the candidate put forward does not have any public sector experience. And we have to, con that's not necessarily always detrimental to a person coming in to lead an organization within the public service. But I think it's important to contextualize the specificities and particularities of the CTRA. Um, Senator Dylan Remy alluded to the fact that the challenge that was brought by the Public Service Association, I just want to make one small correction for the benefit of the public. That matter is on appeal and the appeal is pending. So it has not, that particular area of contention is still in existence. And there's beyond that, either side may choose to carry it even further. So what Ms. Um, Lutchman, Mrs. Lutchman Atterbury is coming into is in fact, one, what is essentially in, in private sector terms, a merger and acquisition of two long-standing public sector agencies, the Customs Act predates the Constitution, it, is, it predates all of us in here, I believe. Um, these are agencies that have been operating along the lines of their own culture. And the word culture came up in the, in the um, contribution of Senator Dylan Remy, because I think that that is extremely important, and it is the area of concern that I wish to raise with respect to the suitability of Mrs. Lutchman Atterbury. I have nothing personal against the individual. I do not know her. I'm commenting simply on what is before us and what I know of public service agencies, particularly these two, and how they operate. Both in my private capacity and being here, I've had the opportunity to interact as a, a um, member of Joint Select Committees and so on with persons who are working right now in customs. And these are the persons, when we speak about support being given to whoever heads the TTRA, these are the persons that this person who will um, come into the position of Director General will have to rely on in order to operate this agency. It's made even more apparent that there would be heavy reliance on the public servants or whoever has the experience with customs and excise and revenue collection because the individual who is being put forward here for the position does not have that level of technical experience. The level of experience in marketing and distribution and even retail banking and all of that is, you know, very, she's very well qualified in those areas, but she does not have the technical experience. Now, when you have someone leading an organization who does not have technical experience in the subject matter, she's not a subject matter expert in tax, she's not a subject matter expert in customs, and so on. And when you, you, you have to look at the functions that the person must carry out, there will be extremely heavy reliance on the persons who are coming into that organization. And I repeat, coming into an organization under very um, 
contentious you know, um, circumstances that continue to exist right now. Section 14 of the TTRA lists the, um, the functions of that Office of Director General. Now, firstly, the person is, um, may be appointed for a period of up to five years, and that period may be renewed later on. So security of tenure isn't necessarily there. And for someone to lead a new organization that is a merger of two long-standing, long-existing, very um, large public sector organizations to not have that security of tenure, I think that is a cause of concern to us as well on this side and to many persons within the country. But specifically, one of the roles and functions that this person has to carry out in accordance with the Revenue Authority um, law is advising the minister on her own initiative, his or her own initiative, or at the request of the minister on revenue implications, tax administration, and aspects of policy changes relating to all taxes referred to in the schedule, any matter that could affect public policy or public finances, and any other matter that the minister considers could improve the effectiveness or efficiency of the administration and enforcement of revenue laws. Now, that is a huge responsibility. You are, you are essentially saying that this person with no experience in taxation, no experience in the collection of, of, of taxes and, and, and levying of customs and excise taxes and so on, and no experience in public policy, no experience in um, advising governments on public policy is supposed to carry out this function. And I find that to be a bit concerning. And I want to put that also in the context of what is publicly reported and is public knowledge as well. When, when Senator Remy raised the issue of wanting to know how many um, applicants they may have had and, and the recruitment process just to ease the concerns of the population. A recruitment exercise at the cost of about $120,000 was carried out and a person was selected and that person who sits presently, I believe, on the Public Service Commission as well as the Statutory Authority Services Commission was rejected by the government. Now, Point I... Point of order, Mr. Vice President. Mm -hmm. This motion is only about the suitability of this person to hold this position. Relevant. Senator Lashmidial, as you are aware, we are discussing two very, very small points. Try to keep your arguments accordingly. You see, Mr. Vice President, it's important when assessing suitability of the present candidate, you want to understand the context in which this person was recruited and why the decision was made to choose someone with zero, zero on her entire resume, absolutely no public service experience when just prior to the recruitment process that supposedly selected her, someone with some of that experience was rejected. So I put that question and say that I think that is a very relevant point because how can we assess the suitability of this person in this context if we are not provided with the information as to reasons why another person might have been rejected for the same position. So that is, I think, a important point, point of order, Mr. Raise. Vice President. This is simply this motion, 46.1, is about the suitability of this person for this position. Once again. Yes. If the previous senator contribution has asked for an explanation of the selection process as mm -hmm. well. Good. Yes, just adding some facts to that selection process thing. Mr. Vice President, the other thing is that, as I said before, you are looking at essentially a merger of two large public sector organizations. And even within the private sector, when you are recruiting persons to lead a new organization, you look at experience in mergers and acquisitions. I've looked through the CV very thoroughly of, of this particular candidate, and I haven't seen any sort of experience with mergers and acquisitions within even in the private sector. This is essentially a merger of public sector bodies and you know, governed by a multiplicity of legislation, their rules and their functions. And so, therefore, we would have expected, again, to see someone who had that sort of experience in guiding forward. Because 
even in the private sector, it is very well established that when you are dealing with a merger, most mergers, and anyone who has studied management, anyone who, you know, um, who reads would know that at the end of the day, most mergers fail because of a failure to manage the merger of two different cultures. Culture and the human resource within our public service as a whole is very unique. And I find it difficult to believe that someone who has no public sector experience at all would be able to step into a public sector organization that is supposed to be leading a, a massive transformation and overhaul of our entire tax system, tax collection system. Secondly, that that person stepping into the environment where there is severe resistance to the change, an environment with unions, an environment with um, you know, the transitioning of people coming in and, and having to transition from their um, previous positions into new positions. The fact that many people may not transition and that you may lose a whole host of institutional knowledge from persons who opt not to transition over into the TDRA. These are the circumstances coming in here. And again, we have not been presented with any information. And as I said, if we had the opportunity to interrogate the person individually, maybe we would find that the person has some experience in dealing with mergers and managing the, the, um, you know, the, the, the cultures coming together and so on of, of different private sector agencies and how they expect to utilize those skills to manage this process. But we don't have that opportunity. We only have what is before us. We don't have any evidence to support um, the, 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 the notion that this person would be suitable to manage this thing forward. This is not someone coming into an established um, TTRA. This is the first person to pick up this particular position. The first person who will have to manage all of the teething problems. The first person who, and I'm happy that you know, Senator Dylan Remy made reference to the transition from the Ministry of Health managing the entire health sector into RHS. Look at where we are with that today. Just look at where we are with that today. Mr. Vice President, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt on a point of order, but Standing Order 53-1B, the Senator is actually saying that she's repeating prior contributions. While you make, a while you make an attempt to defend your, your points, please be aware of the additional position, please. So, President, um, Senator Mark, continue, please. Because the point was made, Mr. Vice President, and I wish to support that point, and I wish to reiterate that we have a situation here where we have had the experience. We have had the experience of bringing in people without technical competency in the subject area to be managers of organizations that are meant to carry out public functions, and they are failing miserably. That's the point. That's the point. They are failing miserably because fit for purpose is important. And I'm making the point that anybody looking at this CV as we are required to do, looking at what is required, considering the environment that exists right now, and considering the history in this country of transitioning public functions into bodies that should operate as statutory authorities and so on in a private sector manner, we are not certain that this is an, uh, an appointment that we could support because we do not deem it fit for purpose. I thank you. Senator Suniti Maraj. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Uh, the previous speaker mentioned the CV as a, a basis for making a decision as a matter in passing. <coughs> Excuse me. For me, it is the heart of the, the matter. I'm quite sure that this selection was made, whoever made it, was not made on the basis of reviewing a CV. All a CV does is introduces the person to you. If the person makes a cut from the large number of applicants, <clears throat> then you begin the process. Interviews, background checks, references, psychometric service uh, um, reviews. In some cases, 
even polygraphs. So we have no idea of what went on beyond the receipt of a, of a CV as we are receiving. And I'm, but I'm guaranteeing everybody here that a lot more would have gone on. What that is, is what we do not know. And I believe that far more information should be supplied about persons who are to occupy very senior positions in this country, positions that require trust and confidence. No member of the public ought to buy literally what is, this is what is called cat and bag. And therefore, with no prejudice whatsoever to the candidate, I would like to focus on the process by which the parliament has been co-opted for endorsing critical positions in this country. We have seen for other um, positions outside of the, the Revenue Authority, how badly some of, some of that has worked, has turned out to be. People have had to be relieved, people have lost public confidence, because the process, he, the process is fundamentally flawed. I raise that in the context of the fact that we are going through some form of constitution reform conversations, <clears throat> which I'm not quite clear um, because I'm told it's a constitution reform advisory committee, whatever. But I think we have to penetrate this issue a lot more to think how do we get this system to work? If we are asking, if we are saying that certain positions, certain institutions need the support of a of the parliament as a large representative body in the first case of the electorate and in the other case of interests. We have to have some process by which more information can be provided for us to be useful. As it is, it's a rubber stamping. Um, I think uh, Sen my colleague here, Senator um, Dillon, um, oh no, I think it was um, Senator Lashmidia spoke about other jurisdictions where you have a, a, a vetting process, as it were, you come before. And I don't think we can just, a joint select committee, that doesn't offer that here. That is a totally different constitution where the executive is held to account by the legislature. The executive is not in the legislature. And I think the, the most common example of that is the American um, system. And therefore, I want us to recognize the limitations of the system. I don't want to deal with the woman, I don't want to deal with the candidate. I do notice, however, that among the things you would want to consider, as Senator Remy raised, is the, this issue of public trust. This is already uh, an institution mired in controversy. The government is proceeding. The opposition is challenging. How can we be assured what we have to be extremely diligent in finding a leader of this, this authority that has the moral authority to carry and to survive that period? One of the things that the point has been raised, of course, is this is largely a private sector person. You would want to be convinced as a member of the public about the nature of these relationships and, and therefore how it might influence judgment, decisions. We, I, I see what the government is trying to do here of bring someone who has managerial experience and to be supported by the experts in the field of customs and other taxes. And those are the experts. I'm, sup, I'm supposing that not, neither of those experts were thought to have the capacity for managerial, managing change. I see, some re I see some reference that may suggest that the person has had some experience in a startup, but most of it is with, you know, these are very settled companies, tasty in Jamaica, they've been making parties forever. It's a, they sell parties, right? But I will just leave that and ask, and ask us to challenge ourselves not to be satisfied with a system that cannot work and is not working. We cannot even begin to evaluate this candidate on the basis of a CV. I have personally never hired anybody 
for over decades of managing on the basis of a CV. All the CV tells me is that you may be interesting to talk to. That's about it. So I hope you will therefore understand when I abstain on this matter. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much. Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, I have grave difficulty in responding to anything Senator Mark said. I was wondering what slander would occur. But it appears that Senator Mark was not able to dig up any dirt on this particular individual. And therefore, the accusation was that Ms. Atterbury, as an employee of Grace Kennedy, the managing director, had participated in an arrangement with the unit trust of Trinidad and Tobago to launch mutual funds in Jamaica two years before, or at least one year before, their post was even advertised. It's absurd. But quite apart from that, if you want to get somebody who is <coughs> qualified and experienced, sufficiently qualified and experienced to deal with this very important and complex assignment, by definition, you're going to have to find somebody who has operated in the financial mm -hmm. sector <coughs> at some point in time in their life. And I think we should, instead of condemning a particular individual who was the managing director of a very large securities, a financial institution in Jamaica, and engaged in collaboration at a Caribbean level where the Trinidad and Tobago Unit Trust <coughs> is broadening its reach, broadening its horizon, engaging in true inter-Caribbean collaboration with a large financial institution in Jamaica, I think that is something we should be proud of. We should be glad that the Unit Trust is doing this sort of thing. And to use that as an example to disqualify this lady is just puerile. But I'm very happy that Senator Mark was not, in his usual fashion, able to make any scandalous allegations about the person before us. Now, to deal with what uh, Senator Daniel Remy raised, the point is that the Revenue Authority is a completely new uh, entity. It is designed to move away from the traditional bureaucratic strictures of the public service. <clears throat> it is designed to create a new paradigm. It's designed to bring a completely new approach to revenue collection. You would have heard of the tax gap that exists for all sorts of reasons, including tax evasion, lack of proper auditing, lack of staff, and so on. And therefore, the person that you want to lead this brand new organization, which is really supposed to be, the person supposed to be thinking outside the box, is supposed to bring a brand new culture that you do want somebody different. And that is why this particular individual with her extensive public sector experience, sorry, private sector experience, extensive experience in managing complex private sector, large private sector organizations in various different types of endeavor. When one looks at the CV, one sees the person was a senior <coughs> manager in Scotia Bank for over 10 years. So the person has substantial banking experience. One then sees a person has held many top positions in large business organizations in Jamaica and also in Trinidad. The person, to deal with the whole question of the person's experience for the last several years being in Jamaica, Senator Remy, through you, Mr. Vice President, the person's first 10 to 15 years of working experience were in Trinidad. And then, yes, the person is also in fact, a Trinidadian. That is to refute some of the nonsense uttered by Senator Mark. The person, she is a Trinidadian. She moved to Jamaica and has worked there since then. But her first 10 to 15 years were working in Trinidad. That's why she did her degrees in 
Her first degree is the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. So you're dealing with a person who is Trinidadian by nationality and has worked in large organizations in the banking sector and the manufacturing sector in Jamaica. This, in my opinion, of course, as I've said in the other place, that you really don't know how somebody will perform until they assume the position. And that is to take some of what Senator Marad said as being very relevant, that you really don't know. You're looking on paper, and you're seeing a person's paper credentials. You're seeing that they've held very senior positions. You've seen that they have a wide range of expertise. But you really don't know how the person is going to react to some sort of critical situation until they're actually in the position. But how does one know that until you actually put the person into the position? When you are selecting somebody for a position like this, as Senator Maraj has indicated, the CV qualifies the person to be interviewed. And then you do various tests, you do your psychometric testing, you will have a panel of interviewers, you will you know, dig as deep as you can into the person, you would have scenarios, what if scenarios, you have simulations, and see how the person reacts to that. And based on that, you would select the most suitable person. To answer a question Senator Remy, Dylan Remy asked, there were 101 applications for the position of Director General of the TTRA. 101. So it was not a sole select exercise, as Senator Mark would have us to believe. So that I believe that even though the system, as Senator Maraj has indicated, Senator Maraj believes that the system is inadequate, that there should be a more robust system in terms of selection, but that is the system, that's what's in the law. The law indicates that the authority will advertise, they will they will go through the process, they will come up with the best person, and they will present that person to the government and the Minister of Finance, who will then, after due consideration, appoint the person, bring it to the parliament for consideration. That's our law. Our law isn't changed yet to have a system of hearings. I, I, am a, I do believe that in, for certain positions, there should be hearings for you know, important positions in this country, like Speaker of the House, for example where there should be psychometric testing, at least of, of a former one. But the, the point is that this is the system. One can only go on what is presented, and I do believe when one looks at this person's qualifications, that this person is extremely qualified, and this person has vast experience I don't know what Senator Mark is screaming about, Mr. Vice President. I don't know what he's muttering about. I have no idea. <laughs> so, Senator Mark. Senator Mark, please, he says from the loud cross talk, please, and commentary. Allow him to finish his contribution. Thank you. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Vice President, I have no idea what he's muttering about. <laughs> but, but clearly there are some paranoid delusions here. So, Mr. Vice President, I have no idea what these ad hominem remarks are all about, but clearly there's an issue here. But be that as it may, with respect to this particular individual, I think this person at least meets whatever threshold has been set within the law. I think the person exceeds the threshold just based on the qualifications of the person. I'm satisfied the process of interviewing and testing was extremely robust and rigorous. And I do believe that based on what we are seeing, that the person has what it takes to lead this new organization, which must be different to the traditional public service. And this is why I disagree with Senator Lachmandial Ramdial. This is not a public service organization. This is a semi-autonomous authority. And the reason why it has been created is precisely because the traditional public service approach is not working. 
And therefore, you need people who are going to bring fresh ideas, who are going to bring a different approach, going to bring a more efficient approach, a more proactive approach. And that is exactly what you would find within suitably qualified persons within the private sector. I heard Senator Mark say that we should hire some young person. But that is in complete contradiction to the job description. The job description demands the person must have experience at a senior level in hiring, in, in managing complex organizations. Now how can you have a, a person just out of school having the required experience, knowledge, and expertise in managing a complex organization at a senior level when they just graduate last year? I mean, it's an absurdity, and it was clear to me that Senator Mark was simply filibustering because he had nothing to say because he couldn't find any dirt on this particular individual. And it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy that for something like this, this is why a lot of people are reluctant to do public service because they come to the Senate and somebody will just nasty your name for no reason except partisan politics. That's what's wrong with this country. That's why we have difficulty in getting good people to do public service because the opposition is simply interested in nastying people's names for no particular reason. Disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. And to answer the question as to whether this person has accepted the position, yes. And as soon as this parliamentary process is over, once the, this honorable house supports the appointment of this lady, the other place has already done so, I am advised that this person will take up office in July of 2024. So that answers that question. And with those few words, I beg to move. Honorable Senators, the question is, be it resolved that a notification of the appointment of Mrs. Patsy Latchman Atterbury to the Office of Director General of the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority be approved. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. No division. Dr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Amal SC? Yes. Ms. Kopi Soon? Yes. Mr. Sinanon? Yes. Ms. West? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Bacchus? Yes. Mrs. Sakramsin Suklal? Yes. Mr. Sukai? Yes. Mrs. Lizama Lissing? Yes. Mr. Hislop? Yes. Mr. Seals? Yes. Mr. Mark? No. Mrs. Lochmidial Ramdial? No. Mr. Roberts? No, PNN. Mr. Gosain? No. Mr. Nakid? No. Ms. John? No. Dr. Richards? Yes. Mr. Fiera SC? Yes. Mr. Timor? Yes. Mrs. Thompson Ayi? Yes. Dr. Dylan Rami? Yes. Professor Hutchinson? Yes. Dr. Patasa? <laughs> yes. Ms. Maharaj? Abstain. Mr. Francis? Yes. Dr. Ibrahim? Yes. Mr. Hussein? Mr. Singh? Yes. Mr. President, the results of the division are as follows. 23 members voted for, six members voted against, there was one abstention.
Honourable Senators, the results of the division is as follows. 23 Senators voted for, 6 Senators voted against, and there was one abstention. As such, the motion is passed. Mr. Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice, Mr. President, and I thank all members, especially the opposition, for agreeing that we can do these two um, matters together, and the independence, of course. Sorry. Mr. President, I beg to move motion number two, standing in my name. In moving this motion, I seek the leave of the Senate in accordance with Standing Order 48.1 to debate together with this motion, Government Motion Number 3, which relates to the same subject. Honorable Senators, is this the wish of the Senate? Yes. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, and I wish to thank all Senators, especially the Opposition and the Independents, for agreeing that we can do these two together. Government, naturally. I beg to move the following motion standing in my name. Whereas Section 13.1 of the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority Act 2021, Act Number 17 of 2021, provides into earlier that the Minister shall by notification, subject to affirmative resolution of Parliament, appoint the Director General and such number of Deputy Directors General of the Authority as are required. And whereas the Minister of Finance has, by notification, dated the 15th day of March 2024, appointed Mrs. Helen Thomas Brown to the Office of Deputy Director General Domestic Tax of the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority with effect from the date of her assumption of duty in that office. And whereas it is expedient to approve the notification, be it resolved that the notification of the appointment of Mrs. Helen Thomas Brown to the Office of Deputy Director General Domestic Tax of the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority be approved. And as I indicated, Mr. President, I shall also speak on the appointment of Mr. Riyad Juman to the other um, post which deals with customs. Ms. Mrs. Helen Thomas Brown is a career public servant who entered the public service in 1982. And this goes to the point made by Senator Dylan Remy in the other debate. These two positions are to be filled by subject matter experts one on domestic tax and the other one on customs, who would then assist the Director General, who is essentially intended to be a manager. So Mrs. Helen Thomas Brown is a career public servant who entered the public service in 1982 in the position of Clerk 1, Ministry of Labor, Social Security, and Cooperatives. She held this position for a period of three years until moving to the position of Clerk 2, Ministry of Health. She held that position in the Ministry of Health for a period of eight years until 1993. She then moved into the Inland Revenue Division as a field auditor for a period of nine years. During this period, Ms. Helen Thomas Brown performed extensive field audit examinations <coughs> to determine tax liabilities in accordance with appropriate legislation. This included the examination of accounting systems and records, performing various analysis, sourcing third-party information, advising in tax matters, raising assessments based on audit findings. In 2002, Ms. Helen Thomas Brown moved to the position of Field Auditor 3, which she held for a period of five years with the Inland Revenue Division. During this time, she determined objections to VAT assessments within statutory provisions in, and the review of audits, further investigative and analytical work. Ms. Thomas Brown also liaised with legal representatives, attended to matters before the Tax Appeal Board, and lectured at the Inland Revenue Division Training Center. In 2005, Mrs. Thomas Brown moved up to the position of accounting accountant for Inland Revenue Division. In this position, she performed duties of an accounting nature including authorization of payments, refunds, reports of expenditure and revenue, annual estimates, and supervising multifunctional staff. In 2007, 
She moved to the office of the Integrity Commission of Trinidad and Tobago, where she held the position of investigating analyst, financial investigator, for a period of seven years. During her time at the Integrity Commission, she performed work of a highly confidential nature in a highly confidential environment. In 2014, Mrs. Thomas Brown moved back to the Inland Revenue Division to hold the position of Field Auditor 4. And in this position, she supervised the group audits in Petroleum and Large Taxpayers Business Unit with respect to the energy sector. She was also responsible for advising, reviewing, and approving audit cases. She has also held the positions of Field Auditor 5 and Assistant Commissioner Inland Revenue Division for the period 2016 to 2022. During that period, she was responsible for the management of the Petroleum and Large Taxpayers Business Unit and for allocation, training, and development of staff to achieve the organizational goals, developing of initiatives and strategies, compliance of audit assessments, research and analysis, interpretation of tax laws, provision of technical advice in respect of internal and external matters, and liaising with external stakeholders. She has also represented the Board of Inland Revenue on several external committees, provided technical advice, and reviewed objections to tax assessments, collaborated with the legal unit of the Board of Inland Revenue in appeal matters. She currently holds a position of Commissioner of Inland Revenue since 2022. In that position, she is responsible for providing leadership and strategic direction of the division's operations, ensuring the management of the legal objections, tax administration, and library functions of the Inland Revenue Division. She manages the debt management, district revenue services, and training functions for the division. And she is associated with the division's representation at international tax organization events. She also prepares executive performance reports and is engaged in every aspect of the Inland Revenue Division's operations. Her educational background is as follows. She is a fellow member of the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants. Now, in the other place, a question was raised with respect to whether she held a master's degree. Because when one looks at the job description, it indicates that the person must hold either a master's degree or an equivalent combination of training and experience. However, as I said in the other place, and I will now reiterate, in order to become a fellow member of the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants, one must not only meet the requirements for membership to be a chartered accountant, but as time goes by, one gains experience and one engages in something called professional development within the field of accounting. In order to become a fellow member of the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants, one must engage in professional development. And on attaining the required, meeting the required standards of professional development and having the relevant experience, one is then awarded the position of fellow, which is equivalent to a master's degree in another field. So she does have the equivalent of a master's degree by virtue of, being, of her being a fellow of the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants. She also has a Bachelor of Business Administration with a major in management from Andrews University, USA. I think someone here might have a degree from that university. And a diploma <laughs> in transfer pricing from the Inter-American Center of Tax Administration. A certificate in institutional governance from the OECD SEAT IOTA IMF organization. A certificate in reform management setting up a reform program, again from that same institution, OECD, SEAT, IOTA, IMF. Another certificate in reform management specifics, again from the same organization, OECD, SEAT, IOTA, IMF. 
And another certificate again, Strategic Management Module for Tax Administration from the same organization. She has a certification in income tax law and practice, advanced accounting and examination of accounts from Inland Revenue Division. And she was also, she's also a past student of St. George's College, where she did her O levels and advanced levels. It would seem to me that this is a subject matter expert. It would seem to me this person is highly qualified both academically and professionally and has vast experience in tax administration. And if I have no hesitation in recommending Mrs. Helen Thomas Brown to lead in the position of Deputy Director General Domestic Tax. I move now to Mr. Riyad Juman, who is being proposed for the position of Deputy Director General Customs and Excise. He is another career public servant. He started his career as an internal auditor at the Ministry of Education in 1991, a position he held for five years. He then joined the Customs and Excise Division in 1996 as a Customs and Excise Officer 1, and subsequently held a series of positions within the Customs and Excise Division, starting with, from 1996 to 2015, he was the officer assigned to the Customs Marine Interdiction Unit, whose duties involved detection and combating of smuggling of illicit drugs, arms, and ammunition through our borders. From 1998 to 2014, he was a member of the Customs and Excise Firearm Training Team. From 2004 to the present day, he, he is the officer in charge of the Customs Marine Training Program. From 2006 to July 2012, officer in charge of vessel maintenance and procurement. From 2012 to 2015, supervisor of the Marine Interdiction Unit. 2015 to 2016, supervisor of the Customs and Excise Container Examination Station in Point Lisas. From 2016 to 2017, supervisor of the Customs and Excise Training School. 20 April 2017 to September 2017, officer in charge of the Point Fortin and Brighton Library ports. February 2018 to December 2021, collector of customs, and January 22 to 2023, assistant controller of customs. His educational background is as follows. He has a master's degree in business administration from the Anglia Ruskin University, and he has a degree in security and risk management from the University of Leicester Department of Criminology. And he is a past student of St. Mary's College. And I think I need it, I think it's necessary, I read this out in the other place, and I think I need to read this out here to show you this man's experience. In 2016, these are all the courses he has done. Instructor Development Training, Bureau of Diplomatic Security, U.S. Department of State, Office of Anti-Terrorism. 2016 again, Biosafety for Border Control, UWI. 2014, International Border Interdiction Training, U.S. Customs and Border Protection. 2014, Maritime Interdiction Operations, NDC, CSAD, OAS, CFAD, DG, DDI. 2013, Maritime Port and Harbor Security Management, Office of Anti-Terrorism Assistance, Bureau of Diplomatic Security, U.S. Department of State. 2013, a course in environmental management with the Delaware National Guard and the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force. 2013, basic knowledge and awareness of radiation emergencies with the ODPM. 2012, police investigation on cocaine trafficking by sea and drug trafficking by container with Copilat. 2012, risk assessment and management in maritime security with the OAS and the Ministry of National Security. 2012, combating illicit trafficking in firearms, ammunition, and explosives with Uni, Unilec, Uni, Unilec. 2012, maritime and port security counterterrorism, Center for Strategic Studies, Galilee International Management Institute. 2010, train the trainer, Arthur Lockjack, 
School of Business. 2010, Carrier Liaison Program Training, U.S. Customs and Border Protection. 2009, Customs and Excise Marine Interdiction Safe Boat Port Security, U.S. Customs and Border Protection. 2009, New Development in Terrorism and Counterterrorism, Special Anti-Crime Unit of Trinidad and Tobago. 2008, Advanced Operations Instructor Training Program, U.S. Customs and Border Protection Advanced Training Center. Again in 2008, Train the Trainer Course, Special Anti-Crime Unit of Trinidad and Tobago. 2008 again, Firearms and Tactics Instructor Training Program, U.S. Customs and Border Protection Advanced Training Center. Again in 2008, Designing and Implementing a Security Plan for the Workplace, School of Business and Computer Studies. 2007, Maritime Port and Harbor Security Management, Anti-Terrorism Assistance, Bureau of Diplomatic Security, U.S. Department of State. 2006, Caribbean Border Enf Enforcement Training, Canada Border Services Agency, and Royal Canadian Mounted Police. 2006, uh, RCS 2000 Training Course, Customs and Excise. 2004, Narcotics Investigators Course, Caribbean Regional Draw Drug Law Enforcement Training Center. 2004 again, Basic Intelligence, US, US Department of Justice, Drug Enforcement Administration. And there's more. Minister. Yes. Um, sorry to interrupt you. Would it be fair to say that customs duties and uh, taxes on imported and exported goods and, their, and the enforcement of border control measures are part of the functions of the Revenue Authority? Yes, we have an enforcement division which deals with the enforcement of the customs laws with respect to smuggling and all of those nefarious activities. Yes, it is true. So in 2003, the individual, Mr. Juman, did an advanced boarding, boarding officer course, U.S. Coast Guard. 2002, airport interdiction training course, U.S. Customs Service. 2002, mar maritime interdiction training, U.S. Navy Special Warfare Unit. 2001, monitoring and control of imports and exports of ozone depleting substance. The reason I'm reading this all out, I want you all to understand that when one reads Mr. Juman's CV, he has experience, qualifications, and training in virtually every single aspect of customs operations, especially dealing with enforcement and dealing with smuggling and illegal importation of drugs, uh, arms and ammunition, and so on. In 2001, Combined Task Unit Training, U.S. Navy Special Boat Unit 20. 2000, Counter Drug Training Support, Naval Special Warfare Unit. 1999, Outboard Motor Maintenance, U.S. Coast Guard. 1999, Basic Marine Law Enforcement, U.S. Customs Service. 1999, Boarding Officers Course, U.S. Coast Guard. 1998, Radar Communication and Navigation, Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard. 1997, Port Security, U.S. Coast Guard. 1997, Basic Firearm Training, Customs and Excise, and Basic Marine Training. So that one sees from all the many, many courses that Mr. Juman has been successfully participated in, from his bachelor's degree, from his master's degree, and from his vast experience in customs, that Mr. Ria Juman certainly fits the bill to be the Deputy Director General in charge of, let me get the correct designation, Deputy Director General in charge of customs and excise. So, going back to earlier points, Ms. Senator Dylan Remy made the point that the Director General has to be a manager. Uh, very effective, proactive, high-profile, effect, you know, experienced manager, but will be supported by subject matter experts. And we now have two subject matter experts, one from domestic tax, one from customs. You could hardly get people more qualified and experienced than these two people. And therefore, I beg to move that the Senate endorse and accept the appointment of Ms. Helen Thomas-Brown and Mr. Riyad Juman to be Deputy Director General Domestic Tax and Customs Excise, respectively. I beg to move. 
Honorable Senators, I now propose a question for debate. Where is Section 13.1 of the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority Act 2021, Act Number 17 of 2021, provides into ALIA that the Minister shall, by notification, subject to affirmative resolution of Parliament, appoint the Director General and such number of Deputy Directors General of the Authority as are required? And whereas the Minister of Finance has by notification dated the 15th day of March 2024, appointed Mrs. Helen Thomas Brown to the Office of Deputy Director General Domestic Tax of the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority with effect from the date of her assumption of duty in that office. And whereas it is expedient to approve the notification, be it resolved that the notification of the appointment of Mrs. Helen Thomas Brown to the Office of Deputy Director General, Domestic Tax of the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority be approved. Honorable Senators, you are reminded that leave has been granted for government motion number three to be debated together with this motion. Senator Mark. Mr. President, these two particular office holders that are before us as nominees to fit into the positions identified in the resolution just read by your good self, that of Deputy Director which responsibility, the Deputy Director General, that is, which responsibility for customs and excise. And then you also have that office working closely with the previously approved Director General for enforcement purposes. And of course, Mr. President, we have a second nominee before us, Director, a Deputy Director General, that is responsible for domestic taxes. Both have had extensive experiences and services within the public service structure, according to what has been circulated to us. So, Mr. Riyad Juman, as Deputy Director General, with responsibility for customs, excise, to some extent, enforcement, has had his career mapped out for him in the public service. And what we have seen, Mr. President, is that from 2022 to the present time, he has served in the public service in the appointed position as assistant com controller of customs and excise between 2022 to the present period. The minister has indicated that, and in fact, in the CV, in terms of the job description, he has to possess a master's degree, which he has. And it is in the 
resume that is before us. My concern, and I like the minister to clarify for us, both positions, Mr. President, both. Deputy Director General, tax, domestic tax. Deputy Director General, customs and excise. The job description and the legislation, but more so the job description, says that both office holders, once they accept these appointments, will be placed on contract. This is troubling and worrying. Does it mean, Mr. Mr. President? Mr. Vice President, sorry, Mr. President, standing order 46-1, this debate is not about the TTRA Act. The, the question of the persons being on contract, it's about the suitability of these people to hold the positions. Senator Mark is straying into extraneous matters again. 46-1. So, Senator Mark, you just want to be a little bit tighter in terms of your contribution. Uh, you have indicated that you have an issue with the two appointments. I would ask you to get to that very, very quickly. State what the issue is, because Minister of Finance is correct. It is about the suitability of the candidates that are being put forward. Well, Mr. President, are we allowed to look at the job description? Because the job description tells you what this person will be doing in the context of what is before us. And I'm saying if you go on the system, which I have gone on, the first thing that you will see is that the job description talks about contract. And that is what I'm referring to. I'm, I'm not talking about the TTRA legislation. That is not before us. I'm talking about the job description. The job description. Mr. Mr. President, Mr. President, point of order 46.1. This is about the person. That's all. So, Senator Mark, the context of all that we're doing right now is that there is a position, there is a person being nominated to that position, resumes have been circulated, the Minister of Finance has supported the motion by indicating the qualifications of the individuals that is being nominated. If you have a response to that, I invite you to do so now. Mr. President, if we cannot debate a matter in the way that we ought to debate it, because what I'm asking, we have a resume that is what, what we have before us. And I'm going through the resume side by side with the job description. That's all I'm doing. I'm not dealing with the personality, because all this would deal. So I'm asking through you. Mr. President, whether the minister will indicate to us when he is winding up, because when I look at the suitability of the deputy director general and the experience and knowledge of that individual, in the context of the management of taxation in tax administration, given the experience over the years, you'll see this person, Helen Thomas Brown, have had considerable knowledge of this particular office that she's been asked to serve in. 
And at one time, I thought that whether we had made a mistake. Because this deputy director general seems to be more suitably placed to take up a position as deputy director general than what we just approved. Because this person is showing you in the resume over the years where she has come from and the years of training, experience, exposure, knowledge of this process that the, the, the deputy director general is called upon in the area of domestic taxes to address. So this person clearly, from what we are seeing before us, seem to have had the experience and knowledge. So that is the point I'm making in terms of what is before us, okay? My, and when we look at the other individual, Mr. Riyad Juman, who has had a long career in the public service in the area of customs and excise. Again, when you look at it from his experience, his knowledge, his upward mobility towards the area that he currently occupies, Mr. President, you're seeing an individual who, even though in principle we oppose this question of what we are dealing with, we are not dealing with the individual per se, even though we know that is before us. All I'm saying is that this individual seemed to be rooted in the knowledge and experience as it relates to customs, as it relates to excise, as it relates to that whole gamut that is necessary for him to take up this assignment or this appointment as it relates to Deputy Director General with responsibility for customs and excise, Mr. President. The issue I would like to ask through you to the Honorable Minister, have these individuals as I posed in the initial area of the Director General, have these individuals telegraphed to the minister that they have accepted this position? So when he's winding up, he can tell us. And can the minister also tell us in his winding up, Mr. President, whether, for instance, the terms and conditions as it relates to the deputy director positions, deputy director's position, have they been settled? And have these people accepted these terms and conditions? And as I'm on this particular point, may I also inquire, Mr. President, whether these persons, I, I was surprised at the length of service that the Deputy Director General, which is responsible to you for domestic taxes, have had in the public service over three decades of experience. I'm seeing that in the resume. So I want to ask through you to the minister when he's wrapping up whether this person will be able to enjoy whatever pensions they would be entitled to. Mr. President, Mr. President, point of order, <coughs> point of order, no part of this motion which deals with section 13.1 of the Revenue Authority Act addresses that point. 
Senator Mark made relevance. He's on a fishing expedition. He's clearly filibustering. So, so Senator Mark, you, one second, Minister. Senator Mark, so you've, you've made two points so far. Uh, the first being that the two nominees before us are probably or most likely overqualified uh, for the position that they're being put forward for. And secondly, asking the question of the Minister of Finance as to whether they have accepted. Uh, the point that you're trying to make now in relation to pension is not relevant to what is before us. Um, given the two points that you've made before, I ask you now to move on to something new. If you have it, there's no need to circle back around to those points. We've heard it. The Minister of Finance, I'm certain, has taken note. So I would ask you to bring new points going forward. So, so as, as I said, Mr. President, I don't know. Anyway, I want to go there. As I said, when it comes to these two positions, within this structure that we are dealing with. We are very clear that these people who are going to be placed there, they seem to have had the experience. Unfortunately, we cannot support, Mr. President, this particular arrangement that we are dealing with to fit these two offices into a structure that will not provide the kind of permanence that they currently experience within their current areas of employment. And that is the point I wanted to put to you as it relates to both Rear Juman and Helen Thomas Brown. Now, I understand without casting any aspersions, when it comes to the question of this particular office holder or this particular deputy director of general with responsibility for taxation. Based on some research that I have conducted into this individual, I understand, Mr. President, that and I cast no aspersions on anyone. I cast no aspersions on any, on any, on, on anyone, Mr. President. Right? I want to make that very clear. I don't know the individual, so I, and even if I know the individual, I'm not about that. But I understand, Mr. President, from research conducted by myself, that citizens who have had funds owed to them by the Board of Inland Revenue, for example, have had to wait so long to secure those funds, even though commitments were given to have those funds given. I'm talking about this individual. We are dealing with the suitability of this individual. That's what I'm dealing with here. So don't rush to 46 one yet. And what the research is showing, that individuals, Mr. President, have had to go to the tax appeal board of Trinidad and Tobago. Mark, I'm, I'm, I'm trying my very best to figure out where you're going. Um, you, you started off, 
I'm confused. <laughs> they're either overqualified or they're not. If we're talking about suitability, you're now saying that they may not be suitable, one of the two, but you're off in a whole different area than what is before us in the position that they're in and the qualifications that have been read out. I cannot even twist it to make it relevant. It's just not relevant, period. So I'm going to have to invoke standing order 46.1 at this point and ask you to wrap up because it's very difficult to make a 40-minute argument for a lack of suitability after you've already indicated that they're overqualified. It, it just won't gel. So if you can, at this point, I'd ask you to wrap up. Mr. President, I'm, uh, I myself am trying not to engage you or anybody else in this matter in the way that I think I ought to. But I would say, for purposes of this debate, and to avoid any um, misinterpretations of what I'm about, what I wanted to advance to you, I will pause at this time and simply indicate in my closing remarks that the two individuals that are before us and the office, offices that they are seeking to fill, they seem to have had the experience over the years. There are some question marks involving one, that is the individual that is in the area of domestic taxes. I wouldn't burden you with that reservation at this time as it relates to that particular individual. All I would tell you in closing is that from a policy perspective, from a principled perspective, we cannot, we will not support the structure and the law that is given effect to these office or these offices. Mr. President, unfortunately, Mr. Mr. President, point of order. This is abuse of the standing order, standing order 53-1B. This is maybe the seventh time the senator has said the same formulation, the same sentence. What are we doing? Come on. Okay, so Senator Mark, you've indicated that this is your closing statement. Summarize and close. I don't know why you are so... I don't know why you are so Senator antsy. Mark, summarize yeah. and why close. Why is he so antsy? Senator Mark. Members, let's not lose ourselves in this chamber. Senator Mark, you've indicated that you are closing, which suggests that you summarize and close. <clears throat> Mr. President, I'm very calm today because we are very clear on what we are doing with these particular um, issues that are before us. And I will just close by indicating that we do not support what is before us in the context of the individuals, because we have nothing against the individuals. We have a problem, Mr. President, with the structure. So with those few, few words, I will rest my case. Senator Vera. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, Section 13.2 of the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority Act provides the Director General and the Deputy Directors General shall be persons who have a minimum of five years demonstrated skill and experience in the area of tax or customs administration, corporate management or areas such as accounting, economics, law, business, public administration, or other relevant fields, and who have a capacity to manage and direct large and complex organizations, and who have an understanding of the welfare of employees. That's pretty straightforward and clear. 13.2 
sets are the grounds for which a person would be disqualified from appointment as a director general or deputy director general, such as if they were a member of parliament, the Tobago House of Assembly or municipal cooperation, an undischarged bankrupt or has compounded with their creditors, have been convicted of an indictable offense or any offense involving dishonesty, or has been certified by a registered medical practitioner to be mentally ill. Based on what has been presented, it appears to me that both candidates are eminently qualified for their respective posts. So I'm happy to support these nominations, and I wish the successful candidates all the best in this new adventure. The country will be relying very heavily on them as trailblazers in this newly minted institution. They will need to display vision and strategy, leadership, innovation and adaptability, team building, financial management, stakeholder engagement, execution and implementation, and impartiality. I have every confidence that these candidates will live up to their potential and I wish them well. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much. I wish to thank Senator Vera for his kind words and endorsement of the two candidates. And I noticed that Senator Mark struggled to find something bad to say about one of the candidates and therefore had to dive deep into the swimming pool of absurdity by me trying to make an allegation that one of the candidates had some defect that caused persons to go to the tax appeal board. <laughs> uh, thankfully that he was unable to do so, but let me just read into the record that the tax appeal board act provides for appeals from assessments to income tax, corporation tax, and other taxes. And therefore, by its very existence, the Tax Appeal Board is there to settle complaints, objections to assessments. And therefore, it is the job of this person currently to assess persons for taxes. And it is natural that not every assessment of taxes will be accepted and agreed to, and therefore the person must go to the Tax Appeal Board. But to try to slander the person by saying, or insinuating, or attempting to insinuate that some of the assessments made by this particular individual found their way into the Tax Appeal Board is the height of absurdity. It's just sad. So here we have two highly qualified and experienced persons who will provide the support for the Director General. They have long service in the public sector, a lot of training, a lot of exposure, academic qualifications, deep expertise in tax administration and in the Customs and Excise Division. I think we have done very well to find these two excellent candidates, and with those words, I beg to move. Honorable Senators, the question is, be it resolved that the notification of the appointment of Mrs. Helen Thomas Brown to the Office of Deputy Director General of Domestic Tax of the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority be approved. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the ayes have it. Dr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Amor Essie? Yes. Ms. Kupi Schoon? Yes. Mr. Sinanon? Yes. Mr. Hussein? Ms. West? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Bakos? Yes. Mr. Singh? Yes. Dr. Ibrahim? Yes. Mrs. Suk Mrs. Sagram Singh Sukla? Yes. Mr. Sukai? Yes. Mrs. Lizama Lee Singh? Yes. Mr. Hislop? Yes. Mr. Seals? Yes. Mr. Mark? No. 
Mr. Roberts? No. Mr. Gusi Mr. Gusain? No. Dr. Richards? Yes. Dr. Vier Essi? Yes. Mr. Timol? Yes. Mrs. Thompson, are you? Yes. Dr. Dylan Rami? Yes. Professor Hutchinson? Yes. Dr. Patasar? Yes. Ms. Maharaj? Abstain. Mr. Francis? Yes. Honourable Senators, the results of the division is as follows. 23 members voted for, 3 members voted against, and there was one abstention. As a result, motion number 2 is passed. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I beg to move the following motion standing in my name. Whereas Section 13.1 of the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority Act 2021, Act Number 17 of 2021, provides into ALIA that the Minister shall, by notification subject to affirmative resolution of Parliament, appoint the Director General and such number of Deputy Directors General of the Authority as are required. And whereas the Minister of Finance has, by notification, dated the 15th day of March 2024, appointed Mr. Riyad Juman to the Office of Deputy Director General, Customs and Excise of the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority, with effect from the date of his assumption of duty in that office, and whereas it is expedient to approve the notification, be it resolved that the notification of the appointment of Mr. Riyad Juman to the Office of Deputy Director General, Customs and Excise of the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority be approved. Honorable Senators, the question is, be it resolved that the notification of the appointment of Mr. Riyad Juman to the Office of Deputy Director General, Customs and Excise of the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority be approved. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. No. Dr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Amor Essie? Yes. Ms. Kupi Schoon? Yes. Mr. Sinanon? Yes. Mr. Hussein? Ms. West? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Bacos? Yes. Mr. Singh? Yes. Dr. Ibrahim? Yes. Mrs. Sarkam Singh Suklal? Yes. Mr. Sukai? Yes. Mrs. Liza Malison? Yes. Mr. Hislop? Yes. Mr. Seals? Yes. Mr. Mark? No. Ms. John? No. Ms. Mrs. Lochmirial Ramdial? No. Mr. Naked? No. Mr. Roberts? No. Mr. Gusain? No. Dr. Richards? Yes. Mr. Am Mr. Vieira SC? Yes. Mr. Timwal? Yes. Mrs. Thompson, are you? Yes. Dr. Dylan Remy? Yes. Professor Hutchinson? Yes. Dr. Patasar? Yes. Ms. Maharaj? Abstain. Mr. Francis? Yes. Mr. President, the results are division as follows. 23 members voted for, six voted against, there was one abstention. Honorable Senators, the results of the division is as follows. 23 members voted for, six members voted against, and there was one abstention. As a result, motion number three is passed. Honorable Senators, before I call on the leader of government business, I seek your indulgence to revert to item number nine on the order paper, questions on notice for oral answer. Pursuant to Standing Order 2712, please note that by request of the Senators in whose names these questions were filed, the questions which remain unanswered at the expiration of question time will be carried over to the order paper of the next sitting of the Senate. Leader of Government Business. 
Mr. President, I beg to move that this Senate do now adjourn to Monday, April 22, 2024, at 1.30 p.m., uh, which we would deem as private members' day, and I would ask for an indication from the other bench. <coughs> The matter on the motion for the adjournment. Next Monday, Private Members' Day. No, the, 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 the motion continues. Is, the, is um, Senator Vieira? Senator Vieira? Yes, his matter, Vera. On, his matter is on the. So you want to, okay, you're going to do your matter? No, no. Yeah. All right, so we'll, we will be doing your matter next. Good, perfect. All right. After my colleague to indicate that once we would have completed the motion by my honorable colleague. We will then pursue our motion on the separation of powers, which follows. So, so because I have been advised by my honorable colleague that we are coming back to back, Monday and Tuesday. So once we complete on Monday, we will start the other the motion that follows, Senator Vieira's, okay? This motion, okay. Honourable Senators, before I put the question on the adjournment, leave has been granted for two matters to be raised on the motion for the adjournment of the Senate. Senator Mark. Yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I rise to address a matter dealing with the issue of the failure of the government to adequately resource the Repatriation Advisory Committee to carry out its work with respect to repatriating Trinidad and Tobago's nationals currently stranded in the Middle East, and of course, Syria is the country. Now, Mr. President, you would all you would recall that it was the Honorable Kamala Prasad Bissessa last year said that the UNC government will do everything in its power to have our children, 56 of them or thereabouts, and some 30-something women and 14 adults, mainly boys, who have been trapped in a certain part of Syria, controlled by rebels, for the last few years. And as soon as that statement was made, the Prime Minister hastily responded, that was in January of 2023, by saying that he, that is the Honorable Prime Minister, will be appointing a three-man committee headed by Nizam Mohammed, former speaker, to take this matter on board and to address as quickly as possible this issue of the repatriation of close to 100 citizens, nationals of Trinidad and Tobago, back to Trinidad and Tobago. When Mr. President, the committee was appointed. It was appointed in March of 2023. One year and one month later, no action. This is NATO. Mm. Talk only. Mm. No action, rather. Talk only, Mr. President. I heard Mr. Nizam Mohammed on a 95.5 interview, and he was livid. And he was criticizing the fact that since this committee was appointed, 
absolutely no resources were given to this committee. And he was frustrated. Next thing I saw, he was appointed to the Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reform. I don't know if that was to keep him quiet. <laughs> but the reality is, Mr. President, that the government has done nothing one year and one month later to rescue or to even get the team, Mr. President, of three visit the autonomous region of Syria to even report back to Trinidad and Tobago. What are the conditions of these children? Over 50 of them. What are the conditions of the women in the camp? What are the conditions of the adults, mainly boys, between 14 and 16? Yeah, um, of them. Nothing. This is a government, Mr. President, that only reacts for the moment by setting up a committee to give the impression, Mr. President, that something is being done. And nothing is being done. And there are Muslims on the government bench. And what are they doing? What are they doing? One year and one month later, the government has done nothing. The committee is frustrated. My understanding, my understanding, Mr. President, is that the committee is locked in reports, locked up in producing reports. Report, report, report. But no action. So the reason why I'm raising this today, Mr. President, is to awaken the government and the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Foreign and Caricom Affairs, who, like Rick Van Winkle, <laughs> seem to be in deep slumber. I want to awaken the minister to do something about that. Report to the parliament. Report to the people. I read in the papers where the minister is quoted as saying, and this is a, is a newspaper, Thursday, April the 11th, and the minister is reported to have said that, you know, this matter requires time. In an immediate response, and I quote, to the opposition leader who recently called for the return of these nationals, the Foreign and CARICOM Affairs Minister, the Honorable Avery Brown, said, work continues to repatriate nationals in Syria, but it is not a matter that can be treated overnight, as there is a national security element to consider. But Mr. President, we all know that. We know that there's a national security to be considered. But that has been there for the last how many years? What consideration, Mr. President, is being taken? So the government has to tell Trinidad and Tobago whether they have abandoned our children, our children in Syria. Tell the country that they are not going to bring them back because they believe if they bring them back, they will contaminate the society. Wow. Tell the country that. So we will know that the government is just mama guying Trinidad and Tobago when they set up a three-man committee. The government must tell the country the truth. There is no, does the government intend, Mr. President, to take action to re Patriot, our citizens, and have them reintegrated with all the security concerns Senator, you have two more minutes. society. Two more minutes. So that is all we're asking. Give us a status report. Let us know. Let the Muslims in Trinidad and Tobago, the Muslims in Trinidad and Tobago, who are calling for the repatriation of their colleagues and friends, Whoever, when I say friends, I'm talking about the children here. 
because the children are my friends too. I love children. And I'm saying the children that are there must be brought back. Of course, I am not saying do it willy-nilly, Mr. President. You have to take security consideration into me or into our account. No problem. But do something. Tell us what you're doing. So the reason why I brought this matter is to get the government to tell Trinidad and Tobago, the Muslim community, and the world what is the position with the repatriation of these 100 nationals that are stranded in Syria. That is all. We want a status report. And when are they going to come back home? Are they going to come back home on Emancipation Day? On August the 1st? I'm just asking, when are they coming back? That is all we're asking. So, Mr. President, thank you for giving me this opportunity on behalf of the UNC. That will bring back, I want to close by telling you, if the government fails to bring back our children that are stranded, our women who are stranded, our adults who are stranded in Syria, a United National Congress government will bring back our children, our women, and our adults back into Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister of National Security. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Just in passing, I want the Honorable Senator to understand that it is a misnomer to say Emancipation Day. It is African Emancipation Day, if he missed it. Um, the member in passing as well, he mentioned that the opposition leader stated that she would bring the children home. The opposition leader is, in my humble view, very populist. We'll say and do anything if it appears as though it would bring a vote or two. That's the member who said, the member for Separia, he just raised her. That's the one who said, knock it and clip it and cock it. It appears as though Zambo took her advice. But Mr. President, the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago remains committed to ensuring the return of our nationals from conflict zones. We have often made this policy very clear. Some countries, like the UK, have denied returning fighters the opportunity to return to their country. They have not entertained them. A country like Germany, for an example, when they return, they are prosecuted, they are charged, and jailed. The children are sent to rehabilitation state rehabilitation centers. In the case of Canada, they are sent to rehabilitation centers on return and to stay there until the government is satisfied that they can do otherwise. And in the US, it's case, it's trial, it's prison, and the children are put in state care and foster care arrangements. We said we will bring our nationals home. There are many countries, as I've just explained, that didn't do that. And in furtherance of this, we have engaged our international partners because this has international implications. And in this regard, we receive reports. We are in contact with those who we have to be in contact with as we have begun the process for their repatriation to Trinidad and Tobago. We have mandated the Attorney General. I heard the member say we have done nothing. We have mandated the Attorney General on the advice of our international partners in collaboration with our international partners. We have designed legislation called the Returnees Bill, which is an ad in an advanced state of pregnancy, if I may say so, in order to manage the safe return of these nationals in accordance with best international practice. We have established a three-man repatriation advisory committee to lend support to the government efforts in this regard. We have employed two persons as support staff to the repatriation committee, provided office space where we had to 
and, and, and the facilities that they need to carry out this work. We have done that. We have identified a property for the administration and management of the returnees because some assessment must be done. The member spoke for 10 minutes and hardly mentioned the business of the protection of the citizens and the safety of the people of Trinidad and Tobago, a high priority for us as well, as well. And the tremendous work and the acquisition of training and learning for the lead agency, Task Force Nightingale, which was started in 2018, certainly continues, Mr. Speak, Mr. President. It should be noted that this is a matter of high sensitivity, emotive and complex, involving external parties, as I said. Moreover, repatriation must be organized in a way that balances the needs of those returning with those of the national community with national security considerations, all aiming at the best interests of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. That must be the goal, by the hype, by the froth, by the emotional explosions. We have a duty to ensure that, that they are safely returned and that the country is safe in so doing. These people, some of them are severely radicalized, including some of the children. We have participated in court proceedings, and we have had assessments about the affairs. We know this requires close management, and that is what we are doing. Recall, it was in March 2023 that the government, led by the Honorable Prime Minister, who took the decision, the bold decision, to repatriate those citizens from Syria and Iraq. Sometime later, this three-man team was appointed, and they are mandated to work closely through the state agency, tasked with the responsibility for planning and facilitating the organized return of these nationals. We see this process as requiring a state-to-state -state approach, which is how we are dealing with it, and therefore the work of the state on this matter is being coordinated, as I alluded to a while ago, through Task Force Nightingale, which is an interministerial committee. This was, that was established to advise on and develop a legislative and policy framework to facilitate and execute the organized repatriation of this group of persons. And to complement these efforts, the three-man committee was put in place. It brings the, the, the family's perspectives to the matter, the individual's perspective to the matter, and the communities from which they have come. Very important. And that's why we have put it in place. In recognition of this, and in an effort to optimize the collaborative efforts between Task Force Nightingale and the three-man team, I would have instructed that the necessary office accommodation and support be provided, and that is indeed the case. There's one little missing link which is now being sorted out. Uh, it is to, of course, make some kind of stipend available to them because they have reported to me that there are some minor expenses in the course of their work, and we consider it just and right and fair in order to do that. So we are now in collaboration with the Ministry of Finance in order to establish that. So, Mr. President, notwithstanding the froth, the noise, the frowning, and the usual gymnastics from Senator Wade Mark, the government's policy is on this matter again uh, very patent, very clear, and we are approaching it in the manner that a responsible government leading a responsible country, not being populist as he recommends, as they offer to this country, but taking the national interest well into account and acting in the way a sober and sensible government must we are proceeding apace. I thank you. Senator Maharaj. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, my motion focuses on the need for the government to address the recommended salary increases for several of this country's uppermost public officials, as contained in the 117 Salaries Review Commission's report. The operative word here is address, because I am aware that the Minister of Finance on March 6th had uh, reported to the Parliament 
having reviewed the reports, this, the 117th report, he informed the country via the parliament that um, having reviewed it, it was found to have quite a number of serious and inexplicable anomalies going so far as to, say, as to describe some of it as irrational. He also outlined the objections that had been forwarded to the, to the government by the judicial and legal, um, by the judiciary, um, which I should briefly mention, because they, they are quite in line with, with what I'm going to talk about. The methodology that was opaque, replete with internal inconsistencies, devoid of justifications for higher judiciary and other officers, premised on flawed, misleading, and in some cases, plain new wrong assumptions, um, formulated based on the application of irrelevant, unreliable, or unexplained considerations, and the product of a fundamentally flawed process that fails to adhere to basic principles of natural justice. Having said that, I have to say, having read the 113th report, it contained the job evaluation exercise, um, details of that, and the compensation um, plan, I have to agree with a lot of what, of the, what the minister's comments about that report and the judiciary's. My, where we part company is in the minister's response, which I think falls short of what addressing those deficiencies require. Um, on March 6, the minister said he, he the, having picked up those anomalies and those problems, the report is being sent back to the salary, re, salary review committee for review, revisiting it, and generally addressing the deficiencies and sending it back to the cabinet by the president. And, I'm assuming that if, it's, if it finds the, government, the cabinet's favor, they would um, proceed to support it. And if not, he has said that, um, let me just get it right. If the, if the SRC's revised recommendations are still found to contain serious anomalies, then the cabinet will make appropriate and reasonable adjustments to the recommendations in the 117th report. I, the, based on my review of this, a, a, a consideration of the source of the problems that have led the SRC in the direction of all of these anomalies, I, I fear that the government trying to do what the SRC did and failed to accomplish might fall into the same trap because what we have here is a constitutional conundrum. And it is time, I think, to fix that problem of the, of the Salaries Review, Review Commission as an advisory body where the authority is in the, is in the hands of the, of the cabinet. The large number of individuals, of categories, of public officials, some of whom are technocrats and professionals, career, um, trained for careers, lumped with the judiciary, lumped with parliament, elected officials and selected officials in the parliament, is the source of the problem. There are no parallels for some of these positions in the private <laughs> sector, as a report says, as, as the SRC attempted to do, in fact, I think the minister was quite, um, his criticism of the foreign consultant was quite stinging and uh, I think warranted. Um, he says it appears that the foreign consultant apply, uh, employed by the SRC will not occur with a full range of the duties, responsibilities, challenges, decision making, and impact in Trinidad and Tobago of several persons under the purview of the SRC. In some cases, there was insufficient consultation with stakeholders. And I question the SRC's decision to hire a firm, one of the, notably one of the most high profile and best, you know, comes, comes highly recommended. Question is, does that, that, did that firm ever have to deal with the compensation for, Ill, for parliamentarians? 
because it's very much a corporate sector. It deals with big companies and, and so on. And how do you match these? How do you align the, the, what, the, the work of elected officials, those of us who come to serve the public, we, are public, we come to serve the public, with somebody whose career and training over years equips them for certain positions. And so, the opportunity is here for us to address the inherent con contradictions of the SRC, not by pushing the SRC to come up with something that seems on the face of it acceptable to maybe the public or the government, but something that addresses the inherent contradiction. In, in 2009, following a what they call the, the MPs' expenses scandal in the UK. They took some very dramatic action with the establishment of something called the Independent Parliamentarian Standards Authority, where they hived off, where the parliamentarians, an, an external body to the parliament, but that was under the authority of a speaker's committee that was in statute, but focused on compensation for elected, for people in the legislature. And I wonder if this is not the moment for us to think, not necessarily to do what the British did, but to try to address the, an, an, an inherently anomalous situation. One of which, one of the principles of compensation for people, for the prime minister, the president, the opposition, the opposition leader, and everyone here, ought to be that you should never be in a position where you are determined in your own pay. Because it creates situations, depending on the political environment, you may deserve it but not get it because it's politically sensitive, or you may not deserve it and get it. And therefore, you need an arm's length. You need something outside of yourselves. If this is, we are in an election season. I, the, the cabinet would have, have to be very brave, I think, to even, maybe they say 4% or some kind of crazy thing like that, because the politics, and you want to take Senator, that- you have two more minutes. Out of, you want to take that out of the process. So what I'm asking here is for a considered response and to address this 117 salary um, report, to address it in a more consider, from a more considered perspective. It, it is a case of apples and oranges for us to uh, align the speaker with a permanent secretary or you know, things like that. It does not stand to reason. We, it's, we, the time has come for us to address the SRC, otherwise we will be button heads, creating animosity in the country, riling up the public at a time when they're under pressure. We don't need that, that is unnecessary. And, it, and the source of the problem, and not the people, the source of the problem is a constitutional mechanism that is not working for us. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. President. For those who may be a little confused, the matter brought to my attention is as follows. The need for government to address the recommended salary increases for several of this country's uppermost public officials contained in the 117 Salaries Review Commission report. Nowhere in this motion is any request to look at the SRC itself, the Constitution, or any other such matter. So it's very difficult, having looked at the words in this motion, to respond to what Senator Maraj is saying. And I will respond to the motion first. It was addressed. and. On the 6th of March, in the other place, I made it very clear that we found many of the recommendations of the Salaries Review Commission to be irrational. I need to reiterate to all who are listening that 
the 117th Salaries Review Commission report is a job evaluation exercise. And that is a misconception perpetuated in the media and other places that this was a general increase, a general review. It was not. This was an exercise that has been in progress for 14 years. For 14 years, from 2010 to 2014, or from 2009 to 2013, however you count it, it's 14 years, the Salaries Review Commission has been unable to evaluate what we do in this place and what is done in the other place. Has been unable to evaluate the duties, responsibilities, difficulties, stress, whatever it is that elected and appointed parliamentarians have to deal with. Has been unable for 14 years to determine what is adequate compensation for parliamentarians, whether in this place or the other place. I want to make that crystal clear. It was a job evaluation exercise. And there's a lot of misinformation outside there with respect to the increases. It is as if there was some sort of collective bargaining and persons who are under the purview of the SRC were awarded a general increase based on considerations of things like inflation and so on. It was not. It has taken far too long. And it is disgraceful that after 14 years, you end up in a situation where you have a serious arm of the state, the judiciary, finding themselves having to write letters to point out that the recommendations of the Salaries Review Commission with respect to them were irrational. And we have addressed it. We have gone through it. We have established, as far as we are concerned, the government, that the salary increases were irrational in many cases. We are currently preparing documentation to send to the SRC. And just let me correct something. Constitutionally, it is the cabinet that decides whether it will accept the Salaries Review Commission report as is, reject it as is, or make modifications. And this is, this is not the first time. It happened under the former UNC administration, where the salary, that Salaries Review Commission had the audacity to try and reduce the transport privileges and transport facilities given to members of parliament. Try to reduce it. And that is the first time I see the parliament come together as one and say that that was property because it had already been granted and to attempt to take it away was a breach of the constitution, deprivation of property. So that we have addressed it. We, I consider it disgraceful that this thing took 14 years. I also consider it disgraceful that the consultants, whoever they were, because they never talked to me, so I don't know who they talked to, did not take the time to have proper interaction with members of parliament, either in this place or on the other side, and so on. They, they, they no, I don't know anything about it. And what disturbs me the most is in, in the 32 years that I've been in this place, I have been selected by my political party to meet with the Salaries Review Commission and to join with other persons. I remember again in the 2010 to 2015 period, UNC was in power and I was selected to represent the PNM, the opposition as it were. Dr. Munilal was, represent, was selected to represent the government and Mr. Hamill Smith, who was then the president of the Senate, was, recommend, was appointed or selected to represent independent senators and senators generally. And we went before the Salaries Review Commission at that time, and that commission looked at the three of us. In a rare, we in a rare display of, of unity, government, opposition, independent, and tell us we're going to cut all your uh, privileges. So I am just saying we have addressed this. This report, as far as we're concerned, was ridiculous. We are sending it back to them. I have made statements on it. We are addressing it. With respect to the commission itself, it's a creature of the Constitution. And we don't have the parliamentary majority. It's an academic proposal to say that we should change the Constitution to change the way in which the salaries of office holders 
uh, that is never going to happen. There would never be agreement between government and opposition with respect to amending the constitution to put the salaries, our salaries, into the hands of somebody else. That's not going to happen. So we have an SRC, we have to live with it, and we deal with it constitutionally, which is the government, the executive of the day, decides whether it will accept or reject or amend the SRC report. And that is exactly what we're going to do. Thank you. Honorable Senators, the question is that this Senate do now adjourn to Monday the 22nd of April 2024 at 1.30 p.m. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. This Senate now stands adjourned to Monday the 22nd of April 2024 at 1.30 p.m. <laughs>